and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Let's get after it here on another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Great to have you with us, Andrew Patterson and Michael Remus. And once again, we continue our week down in Sin City, broadcasting live from Bar Canada at the D Hotel in downtown Las Vegas. First round of the NFL draft is tomorrow. Uh, very interested to see the spectacle around that. Um, uh, Hoping to have my pal Andy McNamara, who's showing up in town a little later on tonight, join us live on the program. Today, however, lots of hockey talk. Murata Tesh is going to join us for the latest on the Jets and the Athletic Fan Poll, which uh, was released, I guess, out for fans to vote on and Athletic subscribers on Monday, as well as, of course, tonight's game against the Philadelphia Flyers in Philly's lone visit of the season to Canada Life Centre. And... There will be playoff hockey downtown. Unfortunately, it won't involve the Winnipeg Jets, but the Manitoba Moose are gearing up to finish their regular season this weekend and then get ready for the Calder Cup playoffs. And the voice of the Manitoba Moose, Dan Fink, is going to join us for a little bit of a Moose update heading into these final games of the regular season and a look ahead to the postseason. And at 2.30 today, or if you're listening on the podcast, later on into the second hour of the show... I'm really looking forward to this. Bob Herrig, longtime Sports Illustrated golf writer, has a new book out. Uh, it's called Golf's Most Fascinating Rivalry, Tiger and Phil. Um, you know, he's covered these gentlemen for two decades, uh, has interviewed both of them numerous times, and has put together a book. And, I mean, you know, we've talked about it at nausea in and around the big events to, to see Tiger Woods back playing the Masters, coming back from his car accident, and Phil Mickelson, after his incredibly historic victory last year at the PGA Championship, essentially persona non grata on the PGA Tour, um, and has, for all intents and purposes, gone into hiding. So that is going to be a very interesting conversation. We'll do that a little bit later on. A busy night last night in the National Hockey League. We'll get to that. Game's coming up this evening. Uh, but, of course, focus in on our Winnipeg teams. And, Speaking of those Winnipeg teams, we'll let you know what the ice did last night in just a second. Uh, but as we get going here live from the D in Vegas, I do want to thank all the sponsors that make this show possible, including our newest sponsor, Wallace & Wallace, F Apparel, Vita Health, Fresh Market, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, Breezy Bend Country Club, Culligan Water, Manitoba Battery, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, the Nick & Nicky DQ Group, Boston Pizza, Princess Auto, Canadian Club Whiskey, and of course our betting partners over at Cool Bet Canada. Uh, so let's get Michael Remus in here and get things going. Remo, how are you, my friend? You know, I'm actually in a pretty good mood considering we're entering uh, the phase here of the season. Final, three final games, three final, I don't want to say meaningless games. However, I mean, they can't get into the playoffs, so... They're just games. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. You know, playoffs, I'm starting to get ramped up. So I'm actually in a really, uh, really happy mood when it comes to that. I don't know. You're in Vegas. We, uh, you know, we did win the award and had our most downloaded show of the month yesterday. It was probably the Nightlife Awards uh, victory bump, bump that we got there. So, um, well, you know what? It's a great moment, actually, to welcome some new folks if uh, they've just sort of discovered us or heard about us and hadn't been uh, been listening. Uh, welcome to everybody, um, you know, maybe some of the newcomers and, of course, all of our regulars, both on YouTube and podcast. Thanks so much for making us a part of your day five days a week here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Um, you're also happy because of the quality of this video you're getting from this setup mm -hmm. here at the T, aren't you? Yeah, well, I mean, they got a really nice setup, so you're on a pretty uh, pretty quality internet connection, so I'm able to broadcast you in higher quality than we uh, have this year. So that's all. I'm always excited about that. <laughs> uh, well, I can tell you that, um, you know, we were, I was kind of joking the, on yesterday's show 
um, you know, the, the first kind of full night in Vegas here at Bar Canada, which is, uh, you know, kind of caters to their unapologi uh, unapologetically Canadian is how they say it. They've got Canadian beers on tap. And they had all the games on last night. Monday night was a bit of a dud because there was only that Flyers-Hawks game. Last night, very different. Full slate of games. A um, few winners picked on the lock shop for those of you that were following. Shout out to you. And uh, I'm looking forward to cashing some tickets as soon as this show is finished and getting after it tonight. And, of course, maybe making a wager on this Jets-Philly game this evening uh, down at Canada Life Centre. Um, but overall, I mean, it has been uh, it has been a great time so far, and I think things are really going to get fun over these next couple of days. Gabe Morenci is coming to town. I'm looking forward to hooking up with Gabe at some point, although I believe he's doing a show at the MGM, which is, you know, considerably, I mean, that's on the Strip. This is downtown, so it might be tough to get Gabe live, but um, we'll definitely be getting Gabe on the show very, very soon. But we'll talk more NFL Draft tomorrow, and I know Hacksaw is going to join us on Friday, um, but the focus right now, for the final few days here is um, is the Winnipeg Jets. But just quickly, Reem, before we get to the Winnipeg Jets, and we do, Nikolai Ehlers spoke today. We're going to play some of that before we get to the Fink and talk Moose. Um, you know, there is, uh, listen, uh, the Winnipeg Ice. <laughs> we talked to, to Munzee yesterday on the program. They had a really nice start. You know, great opening to the playoffs with the 2-0 lead going to PA. Uh, I, they absolutely trounced PA last night. A 10-1 victory. Uh, and the ice can now sweep the series this evening. And as we talked with Munns yesterday, so important to uh, you know get a quick series under your belts. More time to prepare, more time to rest. And for a team like Winnipeg that has such a long ways to travel in most of their series, um, a little bit of less time on the bus as well. But uh, how about that last night? A 10 spot on the road to take a 3 nothing series lead. Yeah, I saw that uh, the score put out by the ice on Twitter. And I was like, 10-1? <laughs> In a playoff game? On the road? You kidding me? Uh, it was a close one, I believe, in game two. So to come out with that beatdown, uh, the ice in fine form, and I'm starting to get ramped up here for this uh, ice plus. Maybe we'll get a sweep, move on to the second round. We could have a uh, you know possible WHL champion here in Winnipeg. So... Uh, this is something to follow here. Uh, now that the Jets are, we're paying more attention you know, to the Moose. We'll talk with Daniel and definitely way more uh, on the ice. Yeah, you know what? I was just texting with Weber, um, who went out to the Wheat City last night um, to see the Wheaties take on Red Deer. Uh, Brandon, of course, got the sweep in the first two games on the road. Unfortunately, though, lost last night 3-1. Uh, you know, very tight game. And the Wheaties are now down 2-1 in their series. I'm really hoping that Brandon can somehow win this series because if they do, it is highly likely that we'll be talking about the Battle of Manitoba in round number two between the Winnipeg Ice and the Brandon Wheat Kings. And just a quick note on the WHL playoffs, just looking at the uh, at the other series before we got on the air today, um, this is going to be the shortest first round ever, I think. You know, the... You've got one series that's at 1-1 between Everett and Vancouver. You've got the 2-1 series between Red Deer and Brandon. All six of the other eight series, Remus, are 3-0 and could be sweeps, um, which I think maybe just speaks to the top-heavy nature of the competition in the Western Hockey League, of course, of which the Winnipeg guys finishing on top of that very, very select group. Yeah, and the ice have been so strong all season, Huss, and... Uh, nice to see it continue here, and uh, they didn't even have um, Matt Savoy, who was a game time decision. So, and when you can have you know one of your, without one of your top players still scoring ten, it shows you uh, the talent on this team. When we've been talking about them, you know, all year, but I think I think you keep a closer eye now that the Jets season they're out of the playoffs and the ice. Well, you know, playoff hockey, the you get ears perk up when you hear that term. That is what it's all about. And, uh, you know, they'll be packing the ice cave for... Uh, listen, if, if somehow the ice don't win tonight, there will be a game on Friday. Um, I have a feeling, though, considering what happened last night, a uh, pretty darn good chance the ice will be having a very fun ride back from PA 
knowing that uh, they're on to the second round. But of course, there's a reason why they play the games. Got to get it done tonight. Um, and we'll, uh, I would love to see them win tonight because I think that might give us a bit more of an opportunity to get a few uh, more folks yeah. from the ice on <laughs> heading into heading into the very selfishly yeah. speaking, of course. Uh, we've had a great time. James Patrick was amazing. Obviously, Brian had some time for us. Hoping to get Kevin O on as well, who, of course, is part of their broadcast team along with Munzee. Um, but maybe a couple of the players as well. Been meaning to get Carson Lambos on, so uh, that would be a nice way to uh, get ready for round two with a little bit of extra rest, extra practice time, and a little time to join us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. But Remo, let's get to this game tonight. As you mentioned, I mean, listen, there's not a lot to play for right now, um, but certainly as we've heard from a number of Winnipeg Jets, and we'll hear from Nikolai Ehlers in a few minutes, um, this team wants to finish strong. They want to play with pride in front of their home fans, and um, it's been really interesting hearing the level of self-reflection um, and honesty. Yesterday, it was Neil Pionk, and as we'll hear in a minute, um, uh, Nikolai Ehlers as well. Um, uh, it was going to happen at some point. Um, you know, these players now with some games left um, in front of the home fans, really with nothing to play for, looking back and reflecting on a lost season uh, that had such high expectations coming into game number one. Yeah, Pionk yesterday saying embarrassing, uh, you know, especially for him personally, who, you know, had a down year, possibly injury related. Maybe we'll hear that at the end of the, end of the season, but we're speculating uh, injuries. Ehlers called it a wasted season. And it seemed like, you know, we all had anointed them off season champions. Sorry, that wasn't us. That was Pierre Lebrun yeah, anointed them. We just we, raised the banner. We just raised the banner. Pierre Lebrun, <laughs> you know, the hockey insiders, uh, Frank Sir Valley picked them as cup champions. So it seems like they kind of drank their own Kool-Aid and weren't ready to put in the work and play the right way to take them to where they wanted to be. And um, I think it was interesting to hear that from Nikolai Ehlers. And I do appreciate the candidates and the frankness. I don't think you want to hear BS from this. Expectations for all of them were high. And I think it is important to look yourself in the mirror and not make excuses. And Ehlers did say today in his comments, you know, yeah, we, you know, we had uh, the schedule and time zones and, no, he said, you know, we dealt with some COVID stuff, but every other team did as well. And they just didn't play well enough over 82 games. And yeah, they got off to a hot start. You know, I remember we were all excited about them, you know, after the first month uh, heading into November. But then after November, it just started going uh, downhill. And Eulers did say it is an 82 game season, but I think, I think we're going to be talking about this for a while. Like, where did it go, go wrong? Probably the most disappointing year. Uh, we've had here in Winnipeg since the Jets returned relative to expectation. Yeah, and, and you know, I know people, I mean, there's always some level of recency bias, um, you know, when you're talking about things, you remember, you know, the road trip that just happened with the season on the line. I mean, the season was already lost, really, at that point, folks, and I think we, you know, we saw as much, um, you know, with the team and the way they matched up and, and fared against some of those top teams in the East. I mean, for me, I mean, I, I still think back to those games against Edmonton. What was it at the end of November when uh, the Winnipeg Jets and the Oilers were battling for the top spot in the West and the, the Jets had started 9-3-3, three, and three, which ironically through 15 games, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was the best start in, since the team got here to Winnipeg. So, you know, something around that point really went south. And we've talked about the Arizona game and the Buffalo game, which, of course, is Paul Maurice's final game. Um, and, you know, unfortunately for the Winnipeg Jets, when Dave Lowry took over, they had that break. They did win three in a row after dropping the uh, the game against Washington. Um, but after the first week of January, um, it basically went down and uh, no real improvements. And uh, that's why we're sitting here having the conversations that uh, that we're having. So we will hear from Nikolai Ehlers. Um, but, Remo, let's just quickly talk about this game tonight. Connor Hellebuck, of course, got the win against the Avalanche on Sunday. It's Eric Comrie getting another start tonight. Um, you know, listen, I, I think Connor Hellebuck, if there's one player on this team that maybe deserves some rest, uh, it's obviously the busiest goaltender in the National Hockey League over the last few years. Um, and another chance for Eric Comrie to you know, get another win, play well in front of, uh, in, behind his teammates, as he's really done all season long. Um, but the interesting move today um, is that Logan Stanley's out and Nate Schmidt is in. And, I, you know, I kind of mentioned this yesterday when we were talking on the program about, I mean, that gaffe against the Avalanche and the, you know, just, a, you know, a terrible decision in a 0-0 game. Um, you know, the worst possible thing that Logan Stanley could do right now, considering the season that he's had and the young players like Dylan Sandberg that are knocking on the door, ready to take spots. And 
Listen, I'd have all the time in the world if they wanted to throw Stan back out considering the circumstances and rest one of the veteran players. Um, but that's not happening right now. Dylan Sandberg has obviously jumped him in the pecking order right now, um, and deservedly so with the way that he the way that he's played. But you have to think about that chance for Stan maybe to to step up and you know try and be the guy that I think he you know, that there was so much excitement about last season with the way that he played. Um, I'm really interested to see where he goes from here and how the Jets handle him because you know as much as we've been talking about making room. You know, by moving one of those veteran defensemen, um, I think it's safe to say that, you know, despite the fact that he was protected in the expansion draft last year, you know, based on the season that he's had and the other young defensemen and what they've shown, far from a sure thing that Logan Stanley's going to be in the mix next season. And he potentially could be another guy that could be on the move, especially considering he's in the press box tonight in a game that really doesn't mean much uh, at the expense of Dylan Sandberg and a bunch of veteran players that easily could be rested with the only three games left on the calendar. Yeah, and I think when you look back on this season, what did we learn or what were the surprises? And I think the team's depth at defense really shone. When they had a number of injuries, you saw Sandberg come in from the Moose. Uh, Johnny Kovacevic played Declan Chisel. I mean, there was a game. There were a couple of games where a lot of guys um, were out, and they all came in and played pretty well. And Logan Stanley, it just seems like you know when you have key goals against, he would be on the ice, and you look, be looking at him like, you know, what are you doing there? And that's kind of what happened uh, on the last game on that two-on-two -two play. We talked about it a lot, and but there's been other plays where, you know, goals against and. You know, the missed, missed assignment. So take giving him a seat, letting Sandberg step in, and him and Pionk, the two guys from uh, Minnesota, you know, they trained together. I think they knew each other growing up. So uh, I like, you know, like that pairing. And I think Dylan Sandberg's earned this opportunity to keep playing. And I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I wouldn't be surprised if Stan does get in, you know, give him a rest and get him in for one of the last uh, two, either Sunday or. Friday, because as we said, I mean, these games, they're not playing for a playoff spot. So you might as well play, guys. And as far as Eric Comrie, I mean, he's earned the opportunity to play here. I thought he should have played more during the season. He's played very well. You know, that was the one guy in the preseason. We got so many emails saying, oh, the Jets wouldn't win a game if he started. And I mean, his numbers, his numbers have been pretty good this year. And he's shown that he's definitely an NHL player. And I think that was one of the story. You know, when you look back on this season, um, that was one of the stories where that he proved that he's an NHL, you know, NHL goalie is in the past where he was bouncing from team to team. Yeah. Um, I, listen, I, I think that, you know, Comrie has uh, certainly earned the confidence that he's got from, I think, the, uh, the, the, the team. Um, maybe the fan base didn't have it going into this year, but, um, you know, he's earned it. He's played well. I mean, you can't look at Eric Comrie being the reason for, really for, uh, for any of this. And it is somewhat ironic that many people thinking that that was an Achilles heel of the team has really ended up being a strength. All that being said, uh, it didn't change the thoughts of the coaching staff in deciding who they were going to play night in and night out because, once again, Connor Hellebuck has been the busiest goaltender in the National Hockey League. Hey, I wanted to get to one thing back with the lines. And this is, I mean, maybe this is nitpicking. Um, I'm sort of surprised that Sanford looks like he's going to be playing along with Lowry and Appleton on that third line and Morgan Barron move into the fourth line. Um, I would think that at this point, with Morgan Barron, you know, at his, you know, age, just coming into the organization, being under team control next year, and certainly a guy that could potentially be a regular for the Winnipeg Jets, I think it would make more sense to give him some, you know, a few more games playing alongside Lowry and Appleton to see if he can be that guy playing with those guys next season. Because I don't know about you, Reem. I mean, I, I, listen, this has nothing to do with fifth round picks, a fifth round pick. They needed to, you know, fill the hole of Andrew Kopp, um, and they made the deal. But Zach Sanford doesn't have a contract for next year, making $2 million right now. I guess there's the potential that he could be in the mix next season, but I'd have to say it's probably unlikely at this point. So, I mean, is it a missed opportunity not having Morgan Barron playing a little more significant minutes on a line where he could be a part of next year? especially considering how little the fourth line plays for the Winnipeg Jets and continues to play very, very minor, minor minutes. And um, I'd love to see a little bit more of Barron as we get through these final three games. Yeah, it's funny how at times this year, Morgan Barron got time on the second line. Svechnikov's even been on, you know, the top or second line. Yep. But when they go on the fourth line, uh, Barron, Tony Otto, Svechnikov, I mean, we're expecting them to play like five minutes and you know, depending on 
um, some special teams. Maybe someone gets gets a couple more. But uh, I agree with you. that been a problem this whole year. They just don't want to use the fourth line. I think they haven't. I don't know, are they not getting the results because they, they don't play? Or are they not getting played because you know, those guys aren't contributing offense? As far as Sanford, I wonder if they did bring him in here with um, the idea that, you know what, let's play him here. Let's see if he likes it. See how he fits in and try to re-sign him. Because I think, you know, trading a pick for a player for a team that we didn't think was going to make the playoffs an interesting move when you know you could probably keep that pick so maybe they are trying to keep him for next year but we will wait and see and he is uh, yeah, playing I, a, a larry and appleton and but i agree with you baron's the guy he's going to be here he's an rfa uh rfa after the season yeah uh, you know baron will be a member of the winnipeg jets in the organization next season i think the question and and listen maybe this is more an audition for zach sanford to uh you know see what he can do in a little bit more of a prominent role playing with those guys although he's played you know up in the lineup at times in the top six as well and i mean it's been fine i guess but it certainly hasn't really stood out i i doubt you'd have many people beating down the door saying the winnipeg jets have to make sure they keep this guy for next season um, and as I said, a fifth round pick is, um, uh, you know, overall, the likelihood of fifth round picks turning into NHLers is relatively small. So I can handle what uh, what they were able to do. You know what I think we'll do, Ray? We'll save Ehlers for after Dan Fink. And it'll be a nice way to sort of transition into our Jets conversation with Murata Tesh. Uh, because before Fink comes on, do you want to talk of what happened last night in the National Hockey League? And, uh, of course, here in Las Vegas, uh, there was a lot of interest about that Dallas uh, Knights game last night, a regulation win for the Dallas Stars would have eliminated Vegas. Um, they didn't get it in regulation, but they got it in the extra frame, a really long shootout that went, I think, seven seven rounds before somebody finally scored. Um, so the Knights aren't officially done, but they're getting ready to read the last rights potentially as early as tonight as Dallas can clinch that spot in the postseason. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are, like, celebrating that Vegas, knowing the pain of not missing the playoffs, uh, an expansion franchise with the success that they had was pretty surprising. You know, with that win that Dallas had, we did have a couple clinchers, Nashville in L.A., and we do have some playoff matchups. Uh, it's going to be interesting what happens with Vegas in the offseason. You, know, you know, they didn't win the Stanley Cup. They lost the other, you know, lost the other series. And, you know, Bill Foley and the management there completely retool. And, oh, we got to get Jack Eichel. We got to get Mark Stone trading away the reigning Vesna Trophy winner. And it seems like all this tinkering has kind of backfired. However, they did have, you know, we talked to, to Gary a couple weeks ago just explaining all the injuries. And we saw that that here. So I think, you know, we don't like to use injuries as an excuse. But when you have your whole top line plus a bunch of defensemen out, it is, and your goalies, it is, it is hard hard to win. So, I mean, they just, you know, barely missed the playoffs, but... Um, well, let's face it, this was yeah. sort of, I think, a calculated gamble by Vegas because I think, as we talked with Ken Bolke yesterday on the program, they were all excited to be the Lightning who have a $92 million payroll in the mm. playoffs when there's no cap. Well, you got to make the playoffs to play all those guys in the playoffs, and that hasn't happened. And as Ken mentioned yesterday, and I mean, this isn't something I'd really ask Gary. I mean, obviously, the guys that are close and working for the organization can only say so much, but I'm sort of with Ken. Considering what we've seen historically from Bill Foley, I mean, the firing of Gerard Gallant, you do wonder what the ripple effects of this disappointing season for the Vegas Golden Knights will be when it comes to pretty much everybody involved in the hockey organization. I mean, George McPhee, Kelly McCrimmon, um, and Peter DeBoer. And uh, I don't really have the answers for that, but I would tell you that, you know, as opposed to many other owners, I think there's far more likely that Foley might have an itchy trigger finger uh, with the fact that there's going to be no playoff revenue coming in for all that cash that they spent with the team here in uh, in Las Vegas. Yeah, and I think the other question that's going to be is, you know, how do you bring back Robin Leonard after Peter DeBoer has been, you know, running the bus over him over and over this season? Uh, you know, playing with an injury, you know, getting ripped publicly for performance. Seemed like Logan Thompson's been pretty capable. We know Logan, Logan, Lauren Brossois has been as well. So I wonder if they, you know, Leonard's future with the Golden Knights. Uh, just an unfortunate situation for him. I mean, injured, playing, not having success. But also knowing that they picked him over Marc-Andre Fleury, who was... And the franchise player beloved by the by the city and you just 
move on from him like that. And he's having some, you know, won the, again, won the Vesna trophy last year. It's a wild, wild uh, situation there in Vegas. So, um, fascinating. I know I see a lot of people on Twitter, like very happy that they're not going to make the playoffs this year. It's not, not official yet, but one point by Dallas or Vegas loss in the last, you know, two games they're done. Yeah, no doubt about that. It does look like we're going to get Tampa-Toronto, which will be an unbelievable first-round matchup. But still waiting to see who the Hurricanes uh, will be playing in the first round, as well as the Panthers. Panthers could be playing either Washington or Pittsburgh in the first round. And uh, Calgary waiting to see if they're going to be playing the Dallas Stars or the Nashville Predators as well. Hey, special shout-out to our good friend Dallas Pauls. Dallas, thinking about you today. I know it's a big day for you. Enjoy the evening and that and that 1919. And, hey, Reem, just before we get to Dan Fink, uh, I tweeted this out last night. we got to give a big shout-out to uh, our listener, Hots007, who sent a picture yesterday of him at the top of a mountain. I think it was Kil Kilimanjaro. I don't have it in front of me. Rocking a Jets toque and the Winnipeg Sports Talk zip hoodie. Uh, that is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Yep. Shout out to, to Hots007. I don't know if you've got the tweet there. If you want to show it for uh, for folks. But, uh, but there it is it, at, the, uh, at the Everest Base Camp. Yeah, Everest Base Camp. It says... 5,364 meters elevation. Rocking the Jets Heritage Toque and Winnipeg Sports Talk zip hoodie. Literally the highest uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk has ever been. Hustler, <laughs> so. Don't know about that. What, what are those shades as well? Are those like special like mountain climbing glasses or are they just really cool? Those are those are pretty dope. A nice reflection. <laughs> you can see his camera actually. <laughs> yeah, his phone in there on that. That's a nice selfie, but it looks great. But yeah, Hots007 tweeting out. Yeah, story I miss listening to you guys. Trekking in Himalayas, uh, uh, but did it bring a priest to the show with me? Ever I don't know if they have Wi-Fi up there in Everest. I don't know if he could, <laughs> if he could <laughs> what the reception's like up there, oh. but pretty high up. That's pretty cool. No, no doubt. But anyway, shout out to him and uh, everyone with us. Great to see you all. Um, uh, again, if you haven't already, or maybe if you're new, looking at us on YouTube, make sure you hit that red subscribe button and uh, do us a favor, hit that thumbs up uh, to help spread the channel. All right, we're going to have Dan Fink join us in just a couple minutes. Uh, before we do that, a big thanks to Wallace & Wallace, our newest sponsor here on WST. Wallace & Wallace is Winnipeg's fencing and overhead door specialist, serving residential and commercial customers since 1946. If your property needs the security and protection of a new fence, or if winter's done a number on your old one, give them a call. Vinyl, ornamental, welded wire, chain link, or wood, they've got the right fence for you. And if it's time to replace your garage door, they've also got Winnipeg's largest select of overhead garage doors. 452-2700 is the number to set up a free estimate from one of the Wallace Wallace experts. And you can also visit them online at wallacefences.com or pop down to their showroom on Lawson Road off of Keniston. Uh, F Apparel and the gang are getting ready to uh, make guys look good for the upcoming summer, whether it's grads, weddings, or, or events. It's time to uh, make sure you got at least one suit that fits and looks great. And it's a great time to talk to F Apparel because all of the new summer styles and fabrics are in. Over 250 to choose from with Andrew and the gang down at F at 190 Smith Street. And if you do have a wedding or involved in a wedding, don't waste your money renting suits for one weekend. Talk to the guys at F Apparel about Suits for the wedding party, you'll get 15% off for the entire party. Find out more online at F, that's E-P-H apparel.com, or pop down and see them at 190 Smith Street downtown. And our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market are getting ready for Friday. I mean, you know that they are the spot with Winnipeg's best selection of local, organic, and natural groceries, supplements, and beauty products. Amazing and healthy, delicious salads, sandwiches, and soups at the Vita Health Fresh Vita Market Deli. Um, they do have it all. And if you've never been there before, you know, it's a great time to do it this Friday because it's Customer Appreciation Day, 10% off just about everything in the store uh, over at all seven Vita Health locations, including the newest uh, location in uh, Linden Ridge Market. Uh, and by the way, they've also got a new fully shoppable website, so you can find out more online at myvita.ca. Shop as well or schedule a delivery with Instacart. Again, they're online at myvita.ca. All right, Murata Tesh is going to join us a little later on. 
talk a little Jets heading into game number 80 of the season tonight against the Philadelphia Flyers. We mentioned that the Ice have had a great start to their playoff run, winning 10-1 last night and being up 3-0. And we are a week away from the Calder Cup playoffs uh, beginning. And the Manitoba Moose are getting ready to finish up their regular season this week and then compete for the championship. And uh, let's bring in the voice of the Manitoba Moose, Dan Fink, on the program to get ready for this final week and a look ahead to the postseason. What's going on, Fink? How are you? Not too much. Just getting set for a busy week here or continuing on a busy week here. And then we're uh, we're into that ramp-up week before the playoffs start. It's exciting times, Huss. It is. What's the mood around the team right now? I mean, I'm sure everyone's just champing at the bit to get out and get into the playoffs, but you still do have a little bit of work to do, although second place has been clinched for the club looking ahead to next week. Yeah, it's that interesting time where, uh, and you don't want necessarily sometimes want to hit it too early where uh, you get into the situation where you've clinched and you've just got a few games to go on the schedule and uh, you just got to kind of get through them and off to the playoffs you go. But uh, the Moose with three games on the schedule played one of them last night and they're utilizing the time right now to maybe get some of those guys who have been banged up a little bit throughout the season, a little time to, to sit down, rest it a little bit, and make sure they're ready to go for the playoffs. So we saw a very different lineup last night against the Texas Stars, a chance to see some of the new faces around the team in Henry Nikanen, Daniel Torgerson, Wyatt Bond, Giovanni, guys like that. And uh, at the same time, getting some of those guys who play a lot of minutes for this club uh, some time to rest up and heal up. Well, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Nikon and Torgerson. I mean, uh, it was uh, kind of exciting to see both of those players sign with the club and uh, show up. And we really weren't too sure how much they would play, where they would fit in. But uh, one of them got their first goal last night. And um, um, just fill us in on uh, first glance of the two new members of the organization and how they're fitting in with the club. Yeah, both guys actually on Sunday had great chances to score on kind of their first shifts, uh, or first couple of shifts, Henry Nikon and first 10 15 seconds he's on the ice got sprung for a breakaway just wasn't able to quite tuck it away and then had another really good look last night but Daniel Torgerson got his first I'm still not entirely sure how he managed to sneak it past uh, Matt Murray not that Matt Murray there's now two lurking around and they're both very good goaltenders uh but uh, Matt Murray of the Texas Stars was able to sneak it past him for his first in the league so that was uh, that was great to see it's always fun uh for those guys to get their first in the league and uh, the rest of the team kind of rallied around him as well but but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's cool to see. And uh, you know what? Torgerson and Nikon, and those are two very large lads. And I mean, Nikon is turning 21 in a couple of days here. Torgerson is still just 20. And uh, they are both up around 220 pounds, 6'3", 6'4". They are large human beings and they get around the ice very well for a couple of guys that big so uh, it's it's cool to see them there and kind of a glimpse of what's to come and Wyatt Bon Giovanni not quite that same size but started to see as he was getting a little more comfortable in the game and in the pace of play yesterday got some good hands in tight spaces some quickness there as well so it'll be interesting to see these guys I'm not sure how much we'll see them down the down the remainder of the regular season here these last couple of games but uh, opportunities there for them to make their mark before the playoffs well, and listen, I mean, I know it's not your call, but I'll ask you to speculate. Um, and, you know, injuries, uh, you know, how long the team plays will all be a part of it. But um, do you think these guys are getting an opportunity right now to sort of give some of the vets a rest going into the postseason? Or is there the potential that one or more of these newcomers might actually find themselves in the lineup when the puck drops on the Calder Cup playoffs? Well, I think it's it's all of the above. It's a chance for the coaching staff to see what these guys have. There was a couple of folks that kind of likened it to training camp a little bit and uh, early preseason action, though at a much higher pace than we might see in late September, early October. So uh, it's an opportunity for some of these guys who haven't been in the lineup a whole ton of late to show exactly and possibly remind the coaching staff exactly what they bring to the lineup to be those guys that either get into the lineup the first day of playoffs or fight their way into a spot if injuries should occur in the moose. They aren't 100% healthy right now. Greg Morellis, Austin Paganski, both out of the lineup. Christian Reichel left the game yesterday, uh, still waiting to find out what his full status is. So, uh, there are spots possibly open, and these players know that, and they want to play in the playoffs, and they want to make their mark on this team. So it's an opportunity for those guys to make their push and try and land one of those spots for the opening night of playoffs. Uh, two games left. The Abbotsford Heat in on uh, Thursday and Saturday. And by the way, folks, uh, if you do want to go to the game, we have some sweet seats for Saturday's game. It's the Military Appreciation Night. Uh, we're doing it on Instagram. So if you go to our uh, Sports Talk WPG Instagram account, 
follow the instructions to enter, and we'll uh, announce a winner probably tomorrow. Um, or, yeah, probably tomorrow. Give people a couple days to get ready for uh, for the game. So if you do want to see uh, some great action uh, to finish up, we'll do it on Friday. We'll announce the winners. But it's live right now, so get on over to our Instagram feed. And if you're not following us already, give us a follow as well. Um, let's talk about these final two games. Um, there's a game first Thursday night against Abbotsford, and then um, the finale of the season. I knew we sort of did the fan appreciation day earlier, but again, with the schedule, the way it's happened, we've still got these games on the docket. Um, how's Mark Morrison going to be approaching it from a from the team standpoint? For more of the same, do you think? Or might uh, the final game of the year be somewhat of a playoff dress rehearsal, do you think, Dan? Yeah, I'm not sure how the weekend's going to go entirely. Might see a couple more of those regulars filter back into the lineup after getting that break. You don't want folks to get cold or anything like that. But uh, this Abbotsford Canucks team is very, very good. I mean, Moose saw that firsthand earlier on in the season. Um, it, it's a team that brings about a hot ton of offense to bear. Um but uh, missing a few of their missing a few of their key guys like Nick Patan, he's up with the big club right now. Sheldon Drys, who's just been excellent this season for uh, both Abbotsford and Vancouver. Goaltending missing uh, Spencer Martin there, so uh, there are some guys missing out of that Abbotsford lineup. They're resting up maybe a little bit, getting set for their playoff run as they have been one of the best teams in the league in the second half of the season. So they are uh, definitely a threat to come out of the Pacific Division. But uh, both teams maybe kind of chess matching their way into this, into these two game sets. So we'll see how the Moose end up playing it. If uh, they roll out more of the regulars and if they actually put out what we would think would be their playoff lineup for one of these games, or if they continue to kind of piece their way through, get some guys some rest while trying to keep competitive and keep the right guys going and get a couple of guys through that series. So should be really interesting, really looking forward to that Saturday military appreciation game. The jerseys look just excellent and it's going to be in your packed house so really looking forward to that great send-off heading into the playoffs yeah no doubt about it by the way i have no idea why i called in the abbotsford heat it's the stockton heat of course it's, it's your deep ahl <laughs> knowledge <laughs> dating yourself a little bit there yeah exactly exactly um big goaltending is this uh, going to be mikhail burton you think uh running with it uh, going i mean cormier's had such a strong season as well i mean i guess it is somewhat of a luxury for mark morrison to have two guys that i think he feels confident to put in the net heading into uh, into the playoffs yeah, the Moose have the luxury of having that three goalie rotation, and they've all been seeing the crease. Actually, the last three games, each uh, one of Mikhail Bird and Evan Cormier and Arvid Holm has gotten the net. So, uh, I mean, initial thoughts, I, I'm not the coach, so I'm going to stay away from it. But uh, you know what? The, no matter who the Moose are able to put in between the pipes, they're, they're in pretty good shape because, I mean, you look at what Mikhail Burden has done this season against the possible opponents for the Moose in Rockford and Milwaukee. Burden's 4-1 and one against Milwaukee, and he's 3-1 and one against uh, against Rockford. So he's had pretty solid seasons against both of those teams. And uh, you know what? Uh, he has been getting the bulk of the starts down the stretch drive, so that might be an indicator there. But as you mentioned, Devin Cormier has certainly uh, played well for the Moose this season and come into some tough spots and make some big saves for them. Arvid Holm as well, especially early on in the season and when the team was going through COVID issues, things like that really picked up a lot of the load when Mikhail Burden was with the Winnipeg Jets. So uh, either of the goalies, any of the goalies able to roll in there and pick up some big wins for the Moose. So, And they're going to need those goaltenders because no matter who the Moose play against, whether it's Milwaukee with Connor Ingram or Rockford with Arvid Soderblom, have some excellent goaltenders at the other end. You know, I imagine just considering what's happened, we had said that I had basically a similar conversation with Munzee yesterday about the excitement for, you know, these WHL players to get back and be playing playoff hockey for the first time in a couple of years. I mean, uh, this has been building. The team knew that they were going to be a, a, a playoff team. Uh, but the minute you, you clinch second, you know you're going to have a home ice in the first round of the playoffs. Um, that sense of excitement must really be growing within that room. Yeah, they're they're ready to go. I mean, they've been ready for a while now. They've been you could say they've been ready for this for the last two years. I mean, uh, you got to remember that much like the Western League there, there hasn't been any playoffs for the past two seasons. So there has not been a Calder Cup handed out. The I guess the Charlotte Checkers are still technically the champs from back in uh, 2019. So uh 
they're very excited. I mean, there's a lot of guys who haven't played playoffs in the American Hockey League on this team, and they want nothing more than to get into their first action and really step forward. But so the Moose are going to have to rely on some of those guys who have that Calder Cup experience, even though it might be somewhat limited. So uh, it's it should be very interesting to see how this team steps into the playoffs. They play a very playoff style of hockey. They have all season long. Looking forward to seeing how they're able to bring that to bear in the playoffs. And uh, those five game series, they come at you real quick. So there's no room to to kind of ramp up into it. You've got to be going from puck drop in game one. You mentioned uh, the opponent is still TBD. Uh, what do we know about uh, about games, uh, when they will be? And I guess maybe mention to folks how they can get uh, on board and uh, you know count themselves in with tickets for what will hopefully be a real fun uh, and extended playoff run for uh, for the Moose. Yeah, so we will know by the end of the weekend who the uh, who the opponent will be. Uh, could know by Friday at the earliest. Is uh, Rockford plays tonight? If they are able to defeat the Iowa Wild here this evening, that will set up a showdown on Friday between them and the Milwaukee Admirals. All these rescheduled games, you couldn't have planned it any better, it seems like. Uh, so it, we'll have that game. If Milwaukee wins that game on Friday, regardless of the result with Rockford tonight, Milwaukee is into that third spot. If Rockford wins that game on Friday. They have three games left, including tonight's game. They just have to win one other game, and then they're in into that spot. So it's coming right down to the wire between those two teams. Don't ask me to pick because uh, it's it's going to be close no matter what. Uh, these Central Division teams have been so tight all through the season. Obviously, Chicago has been out there in the uh, in the lead for most of the season. But uh, even, I mean, the Rockford Ice Hawks have taken down the Chicago Wolves many a time. The Moose split their season series against them. It's, it's a very tight division, and uh, it's very exciting heading into the playoffs. And you were asking about uh, how folks can get involved. If you want to jump in early, Get on the bandwagon now. Get your playoff packages before the single game tickets go on sale. You can book your seat. Don't even have to worry about it. Uh, you can. There's multiple ways. You can do the pay as we go. You can do the the lump sum things like that. But it's some incredible value. You can get into the building starting at sixteen fifty a ticket uh, for the whole playoff run, and that's uh, a pretty pretty good deal when it comes to uh, some playoff hockey at uh, Canada Life Center. So moosehockey.com/slash/playoffs if you want to get more information on those playoff packages, and we'll obviously have more information very soon about when those single game tickets will go on sale. Hey, I got to ask you this, and I mean, I don't know whether you even know the answer, but I was just thinking about this this morning, knowing we were going to have you on. With the Jets finishing up their season on the weekend and clearing everything out on Monday, do the Moose get to move into the big dressing room for the playoffs? Or <laughs> no, are they, they, still no be they will not be moving spot? into the Jets dressing room. <laughs> they will not be moving into the Jets dressing room unless something has drastically changed, but I would not <laughs> see that to be the case. No, well, the I'll Moose will be staying at home in their room and uh, – you know what? It's uh, it's a great facility on the other side of the rink there from the Jets room and uh, looking forward to spending a little more time downtown as uh, we get ready for this playoff drive. Well, and the uh, bottom line is, I mean, the goal of every one of these players in the American Hockey League is to eventually move into that Jet dressing room at some point in the future and uh, no better opportunity to help one's cause than have uh, some great performances at playoff time when it really counts. It's hey, it was, who was it? Daryl Sutter just a couple of weeks ago saying that's where guys make their name. That's where you hear about players is in the playoffs. So a good playoff drive can definitely raise a player's stock and really show at the toughest time of year what a player is made of. And the Moose certainly have a bunch of guys who have logged time with the Winnipeg Jets this season. 14 players have played on both rosters and uh, really looking forward to, to seeing how that experience helps out. And uh, if these Moose are able to, to put it all together and uh, go on a deep run, certainly looking forward to it to be very exciting last time they were in they got to the second round before bowing out to the rockford ice hogs and uh, would certainly like to go a little further this time around dan fink is the voice of the manitoba moose getting ready for thursday and saturday the final two games of the regular season and then the calder cup playoffs beginning next week in a best of five series that will begin uh, regardless of whether it's milwaukee or rockford at canada life center now you mentioned the teams preparing for the playoffs what about you? How are the pipes? Are, are the pipes playoff ready, Fink? 
Oh, we're there. They've been ready for a little while now. I haven't called a playoff game since ooh, 2011, I think it is, when I was back doing Laurent Jice Wolves games. Uh, so <laughs> very, very excited for the playoff. I don't know if you've I've said I think I'm looking forward to about 80 times during this interview. So uh, it's it's really exciting and uh, just trying to keep focused on this week. There's a lot that we have to do in the office over the next couple of weeks to get ready for the playoffs. So uh, just trying to keep the focus there and ready to let loose once we drop the puck in game one well you know what having been on your side of things with the organization for a number of years back in the day this is the most exciting time of the season uh we know everyone both on the ice and in the office has been working hard for this moment and you know listen as disappointing as it is not to have the winnipeg jets in the playoffs right now i think it is going to be a great opportunity for some people to maybe spend a little bit more time downtown checking out the manitoba moose a number of players that you know will hopefully be winnipeg jets at some point but right now it's about a calder cup run and uh who knows, maybe we can get some of those vibes of 2009 starting uh, when we get going next week. Daniel, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, best of luck the rest of the week, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you next week as we get ready to uh, hopefully pack the house for some Moose playoff hockey at Canada Life Centre. It's going to be fantastic. This team deserves all the support in the world. I mean, they're such a great group of guys. They've worked so hard for this, and I'm really it's, it's going to be exciting to see what kind of playoff action that Winnipeg can bring to Canada Life Centre this summer. Have a great call on Thursday and Saturday, Dan, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully ha uh, hook up next week once we've got a little more clarity about uh, the schedule, the opponent, and uh, for a full playoff preview here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Uh, take care, pal. Thanks, Wes. We'll talk to you soon. It is. There it is, Dan Fink. You can follow him on Twitter at Daniel the Fink. And again, moosehockey.com for all information on playoff packages. Uh, and as soon as when we know what's happening with that first round series, you'll hear it here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. All right, looking forward to having Murat Atesh come up with us in just a few minutes. Uh, before that, I do want to hear from Nikolai Ehlers, uh, but I do want to give a big shout-out to our friends at Culligan Water. Hey, I'm in Vegas right now. You know, depending on what you're up to at night, you definitely need to be hydrating. And I will say this, um, and I've been saying it all week, I really miss the great taste of Culligan Water. The bottled water here just hasn't been cutting it, to be honest, and uh, don't even think about the tap. Uh, but whatever your water needs are, in Winnipeg, talk to the experts at Culligan. They have been the leaders in the industry for 65 years, taking care of Manitobans as a family-owned business here in the city. And they do have it all. Water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, home cooler, uh, home systems and drinking water systems, not to mention city-wide water delivery services and commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Whether it's for the home, the cottage, or the office, Culligan has you covered. 1200 Sargent Avenue, 694-5180, or you can hit them up online at drinkculligan.com. Well, Manitoba Battery is ready for summer. Well, we're all ready for the summer. We just sort of get here, at least spring, um, but new summer hours right now as people get ready to maybe work on those cars, golf carts, boats, whatever they need. They're open later for you right now. 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Donnie and his staff are waiting for you. And again, they had the big farm sale last week. But, you know, with maybe a bit of a delay on some things happening out in the rural areas, still do have time to come in and get uh, the uh, best prices in town on all of your battery needs. And if you are coming in from the city, best way to do it, I've come from outside the city, best way to do it is phone in your order. And uh, Donnie and the gang will have your order ready to uh, go. Uh, and of course, you're saving money over the big box stores like Canadian Tire and Costco, getting the best deal, save time, and uh, supporting local as well. Manitoba Battery is at 1026 Logan Avenue, 783-8787, and online at manitobabattery.com. And uh, hey, with the uh, playoffs coming, Royal Sports is ready for it. I mean, maybe you've got a second favorite team outside of the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, listen, it's not just Winnipeg Jets merchandise at Royal Sport. They literally have the best selection in Winnipeg for all the National Hockey League, not to mention the NBA. We'll talk Raptors tomorrow, getting ready for that big game six in T.O. And, of course, the Red Hot Blue Jays as well, not to mention Canada soccer gear coming in as well. And outside of merchandise, they are the spot for all sorts of sports equipment, whether you're a soccer player, softball, baseball, looking for a new bike, or just want to get in on uh, maybe getting into shape and a bit more active with their expanded fitness section, pop down and see it all. 750 Pembina Highway and uh, at Royal Sports Pembina on Instagram. Make sure you give them a follow for all of the latest 
uh, merchandise drops and deals. Um, all right, listen, we're going to hear, you know, maybe we'll get to Nikolai Ehlers afterwards. Uh, we've got this ready. We will play it for you. But uh, it does look like we've got our good friend Murat Atesh ready to go. So uh, we can get right into that and we'll hear from Nikolai Ehlers and maybe even a little bit of Dylan and Schmidt if we've got time a little bit later on. But uh, let's welcome him in from The Athletic. Murat Atesh joins us now. Murat, what's going on? How are you? Hey, Huss. I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I just want to alert you, if I panned left or right in either direction, you would see chaos because the the winter storm slash rainfall of the weekend got to me. We have some basement flooding, and it's been a oh. little bit touch and go around these parts. But we're good. This is the joy in my day. We are here for it. I'm here for you. Let's go. Oh, man, that sucks. I mean, and uh, listen, I've been you know hearing this from so many people. I mean, what a bizarre stretch of weather. We've had really this entire winter, but to finish it off two weeks ago with the blizzard and then the nonsense that happened on the weekend, let's just hope that we can get to some playoff hockey to watch and some nicer weather outside uh, and not deal with everything you have. So uh, I, <laughs> I feel for you, buddy. I know there's a lot going on. Um, you know, let's talk about this game tonight for a minute. I do want to get to the fan poll, and I know you're, uh, you know, getting, I mean, <laughs> we were talking off air. I sort of know what some of the responses are going to be based on this entire season. Um, but I'll say this, like the way the team played, and I think it was important for them to get that result as they did on Sunday. Um, but it's interesting to see. I mean, no Logan Stanley tonight, I think, speaks to, you know, the season he's had and certainly the uh, the gaffe that gave Colorado the, uh, the, the lead. Um, it would be very easy to uh, shut a veteran or two down. Um, Dylan Sandberg's certainly going nowhere right now, but uh, what do you make of the fact that Stanley, with three games left as a young player, is not in the lineup tonight? Yeah, I think it speaks to what Dave Lowry has really made his priority for the last little while. And whether you agree with the decisions or not, the lineup decisions, the not bringing in prospects to play, the the lack of call-ups or, or what have you, I think he said that they'd use two officially. They have room for four. You know, what you're seeing is Winnipeg trying to win out. There is no tank. There is no preview of the future. There is no... Uh, there's nothing but Dave Lowry and company doing its best to win hockey games towards the end of the season. You can agree or disagree with that, but I think for the Jets, it's a certain sense of pride. Um, and each person in that room will have a different, different, uh, I guess, perspective and opinion. The individual players will be playing for pride, perhaps jockeying for you know reputation and spots next year. But from the top, Dave Lowry in this situation, I think he's genuinely icing the roster every single night that he thinks is going to give himself the best chance to win games. And in this case, with Logan Stanley struggling, and it hasn't been a particularly strong year for him, which is unfortunate. I like the guy a lot. Um, but... When you have a season that is that underwhelming and you are essentially the seventh best defenseman of that group right now, in my opinion, and then that that mistake happens, I think that's simply Dave Lowry responding to the on-ice play. And it is disappointing. And Logan Stanley can be a part of the Winnipeg Jets' future. But here and now, I don't think that Dave Lowry believes he gives him the best chance to win tonight. Well, and, and I think in a lot of ways, it's sort of a microcosm of his entire season. I mean, and listen, there are a lot of sophomores that take a little bit of a step back. But I mean, compared to the way that he played last year, that I think earned him the confidence that they wanted to make sure they didn't lose him to the point that they protected him in the expansion draft. Um, it seems like it's a very different situation right now and very damaging, I think, to his prospects going forward just for the fact that we've spent so much time talking about these younger players that seem to be ready to push for jobs. We'll talk about maybe moving one of those uh, those vets at some point over the course of the offseason, maybe more. But I'd have to think that considering the fact that he's on the outside looking in with three games left in the regular season, uh, I think there'll be some speculation of a possibility that, you know, is Logan Stanley part of the long-term future for the Winnipeg Jets next season? I certainly think that he'll have the opportunity to do that, but there's a far different level of competition in my mind or playing time and spots on the blue line. And uh, I think he's got a long ways to go to sort of make up for some lost ground this year with a great opportunity that was presented to him. Absolutely. There's going to be talk about transformation of that Winnipeg Jets defense core and whether it's veterans like Schmidt and Dylan who um, weren't able to single-handedly or two-handedly, I guess, um, re rectify Winnipeg's defensive issues, whether it's, you know, highly touted prospects like Ville Hainala or what have you. There are going to be 
discussions about Jets defensemen being traded all summer long until we get a sense of what next season looks like. And in Logan Stanley's case, he's in such an interesting spot. He's obviously been a lightning rod for Jets fans, pundits, all of those sorts of things since the day that he was drafted, since Winnipeg traded up to acquire him in 2016. And I think that there's some unfortunate dialogue that comes around it. I think part of the devastating disappointment that a lot of people are feeling around Logan Stanley is people got perhaps a bit too excited last season. And so I'll only speak for myself. When you do a deep dive of Logan Stanley's success last season, and uh, again, speaking for myself, camp notes, training camp 2021, my notes are Logan Stanley is putting his partner in a better position than I've ever seen before. He has a better sense of calm. He's moving the puck better than I've ever seen before. This could be an NHL player. This is the discussion. So I would like to establish that there's some street cred on my part saying I recognized his leap forward as it was happening. But if you do a deep dive analysis of the season that he had last year, the one that he was plus a whole bunch, his numbers looked good from the on ice goals anyways, it looked like the other teams weren't scoring. You look at the way that the Winnipeg Jets coaching staff ran its bench, and there has seldom been a Winnipeg Jets defenseman sheltered as much as Logan Stanley was last season. He was played in a third pairing role. He was kept far, far away from anything resembling top six competition uh, on other teams by design. This was good coaching of a young player breaking into the league, providing as sheltered of an opportunity as possible. And that's part of why he had success, in addition to the things that he did himself. Um, you know, you have to go back to Tucker Pullman and Ben Sherratt on the third pairing in 2017 to find defensemen as sheltered as Stanley was. And guess what? Both of those guys had tremendous numbers during that sheltering as well. So you come out of that, you saw, you you depend on, sorry, depending on your perspective, you might look at the amazing plus number that he had and think this is a surefire top four guy. He's going to the top, all that sort of stuff. That was never realistic. And setting your expectations for what his season could have been as a top four defenseman or that kind of progress was, again, I'll repeat, never realistic. The idea that he could continue and develop into a solid third pairing guy with some physicality who can move the puck, who is willing to get the puck to the net from time to time. Um, he's still learning to choose his lanes in that sort of regard. I mean, there's a potential NHL future uh, defenseman here who contributes positively to a third pairing and whose teammates adore him, who can add physicality, who's willing to fight from time to time. That's a good, valuable player. Um, and I think that's still the ceiling for him. I don't think that it was reasonable for a top four projection, nor do I think that he's uh, absolutely on the way out. Because let me tell you, the proponents that he has within the Winnipeg Jets are still within the Winnipeg Jets. And they still, you know, he is a contentious player because of what he does well and what he doesn't do well. But they, the belief in him, I think, maintains itself, especially in important shares within the Jets organization. Yeah, you know, I mean, the thing that really kind of changes things from my perspective is the fact of, um, you know, so many other players that are pushing for that same opportunity that he was given this year. It didn't happen in training camp through the injury to Dylan Sandberg, but I'm interested in your thoughts. I mean, he looks like he's been here for a long time. I mean, uh, we were speaking yesterday on the program and said, you know, if you just watch that game on Sunday night, I don't think you would know that Dylan Sandberg is a guy with just a handful of NHL games under his belt. Um, he is doing a lot right now to, I think, uh, put him at the top of the pecking order to be a regular, capable of maybe more even than the third pairing, you know, into the future. Maybe not necessarily at the beginning of next season, Marat. Yeah, I see Dylan Sandberg's ceiling as a top four defenseman. You know, he's not going to run a power play. He's not going to dominate from an offensive point of view. But when you think of we're raised on the idea that, hey, if you don't notice a defenseman, he's probably doing something good. We usually think that's a stay-at-home guy. Well, Dylan Sandberg, in the last couple of games, that game that he had, pardon me, on Sunday, where the little things that he's doing, those short passes that he makes to help create a breakout, when he leads a breakout multiple times, if you just ISO on Dylan Sandberg, he's leading the breakout, he's reading what happens in front of him, he has a few different options, and he's been able to look off opposing four checkers, by which I mean sell a particular pass or particular lane, stay patient, 
wait for the play to unfold and then make a really nice pass to somebody in a good position. Dylan Sandberg did that quite a few times on Sunday, multiple times. He also was there for the big shot blocks. He was there for physicality. Um, when defending his own blue line off the rush, he was willing to step up on people, gap close, gap tight, and, and make the stops and stop them from turning into scoring chances. These are the quiet things that I think a lot of times uh, it's, it's tougher to notice unless you're isolating on a player like that. And he's doing all of those things at a professional NHL level right now so I agree with you this is a really bright spot and then I think Huss like let's go back to September his training camp injury heading into camp if you were Dylan Sandberg looking at the seven guys in front of you I'm including Nathan Beaulieu in that from the Jets perspective you were probably thinking you could have the camp of your life and not win an NHL job that's not necessarily the ideal template moving forward. Obviously, his injury was a trouble spot for him, and uh, it took some time to get going. Even his first couple games back for the Moose, he was still finding his way, to be sure. But he's reached a very impressive level. And if Dylan Sandberg enters September 2022 training camp, feeling like he could have the camp of his life and still not win a job, then I don't think Winnipeg's done his job this offseason. Uh, Marana Tesh of The Athletic with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Uh, moving up front, uh, interesting switch tonight. Um, Morgan Barron's going to be playing on the fourth line. Um, and Sanford's playing with Lowry and Appleton. Sanford being a UFA. You think this is an audition trying to give Sanford a little bit more time on a, you know, a line like with Al Lowry and Appleton to see whether he might fit in for the future? Or um, I'll be honest, I was sort of hoping we might see a little more consistent opportunity for Morgan Barron. Because, of course, a younger player under team control, he will be with the organization next season. Um, and even if he's on the fourth line, certainly considering the situation, I'd love to see that fourth line play a little bit more. But uh, what do you make of the lineup for tonight's game against Philly with Sanford on the third line and uh, Morgan Barron playing with Toninato? Well, I think it speaks to what Winnipeg's ideal was in acquiring Sanford in the first place. Uh, they believe he's big. He can play that checking line type of game. And I think that Dave Lowry looks at his lineup and thinks that that's what's going to give him the best chance to win tonight. I think that's what these decisions are based off of. I don't think he's looking long term. And certainly when asked about long term, he really hasn't you know, taken that direction with his answer. He's talking about winning these games right here and now. And I think honestly... I think that that's a bit misguided and has been a Winnipeg Jets issue for the last couple of seasons. There are opportunities to give players ice time uh, that are going to be, just like you said, part of the future. Who for whom that opportunity can actually translate into confidence, into a suggestion what about what roles that they can play in the future. I don't think Morgan Barron, since that goal and an assist game, has played an absolutely stunningly wonderful round of hockey, but I do think he has a good future as a bottom six NHL player, and I think that that future is in Winnipeg. He's under contract, and I think it's a bit of a waste to, to bury that player on the fourth line at the expense of Sanford, especially because... Sanford is not under contract, and I don't particularly expect that he's going to be signing in Winnipeg this summer. I certainly could be wrong on that front. But if that's the situation, you've got a pending UFA playing top nine minutes in this situation, I just think of that as a waste. I, I, just, I think that a big part of what you would ideally like to do as leadership in the Jets right now is get back to playing quote unquote the right way, but also to show the guys that are going to be part of your future that you believe in them, that you value them, all of those sorts of things. And I don't think that burying players with contracts on the fourth line at the expense of UFAs is a good way to do that. Uh, Marat, um, back to Sam, uh, Sandberg for a minute on the blue line. Uh, we'll see the Hermantown connection tonight. Uh, he and Neil Pionk will be playing together. Um, what did you think of what we heard from Neil Pionk yesterday? Um, some pretty frank, honest assessment of both the team and his own season, uh, which certainly was disappointing on both accounts. Absolutely. I, I like when people are willing to say that they didn't play well or the team didn't play well. It doesn't have to be a, a moment full of histrionics. It can be completely calm and articulate. And I think that by stepping up and saying that, you know, he felt embarrassed by the way uh, the season went, I thought that that was powerful stuff from Neil Pionk. I think he's a really competitive person. I think he recognizes that um, that he didn't have a strong season, and certainly he's spoken to that as well. And I think that that's important to acknowledge because if you're looking forward and you're trying to build solutions in Winnipeg, you have to name what the problems are. And if the problems involve key players not having strong seasons, they need to be able to name that and then identify what went into it. 
in Neil Pionk's case, we know that um, you know he had two very good seasons before this one, so that's encouraging. We know that he had some injury issues with the concussion, and then and then more as the season went on. We know that he's not playing in Worlds to give himself a chance to heal. So there might be that might be a way that explains it. At the same time, the absolute truth is that Neil Pionk um, went from Winnipeg's best defenseman, replacing Josh Morrissey for that title, to giving that title up and then some this season. He was not the excellent, um, you know, second pairing defenseman that he had been. And I think that it speaks volumes that he was willing to name it. I think that he was leading by example as well, saying that he'd like to look in the mirror and and certainly hopefully all the all the Jets players and, and coaching and leadership are doing that as well. Um, I think that for me, I like when people name the issue and aren't afraid to do so. So I like that a lot from Neil Pionk. Well, I, I do too. Um, and I, I listen, I mean, we know where things are at with the club over, um, you know, we have pretty much known for the last month, but the last couple of weeks, um, it, it has been such a different tone. I mean, the frank honesty we've heard from so many players, um, I think is refreshing for a lot of people. But at the same point, I think that, you know, maybe we'd be having different conversations right now about where the team is if maybe some of that was uh, tackled earlier on this season as opposed to just coming clean when uh, playoff hopes were completely at zero. You know, I, I agree with you to an extent. I agree that the sooner that these conversations happened, the better it would be. The sooner that people were willing to name the issues, the better it would be. And I, I'm not sure that they weren't doing that internally, right? I think it takes missing out on that playoff spot or it takes the deep disappointment of not living up to expectations for that to become public discourse. At the same time, I think it is noteworthy that we are seeing a transformation in the dialogue. And I think it's noteworthy as well that we're seeing it from those mid-20s prime-age players. They're the ones driving the bus of this conversation. And I think that that is a sign that folks have gotten a little bit frustrated with uh, with how the team has played, how it's prepared itself, how it's responded to certain things, and that they're willing to become some of the strongest voices on those issues is, for me, in addition to the fact that, yes, it should have happened earlier to a certain extent, I think that there's courage, there's bravery, and I think that we're also seeing a transformation of who Winnipeg's most vocal leaders are in a really public and noticeable way, and I don't think we should overlook how important that is. I think that that's an important transformation that may help uh, may help the team's prospects going forward. No, I, uh, I, I fully agree on that. And, and listen, I think we've seen, you know, over the course of this season, um, you know, a natural changing of the guard when it comes to the leadership group of the club. Blake Wheeler's still the captain. He's still a big, big part of that group. Um, we haven't heard a lot from Mark Shifley, and of course, he hasn't played very much over the last little while since being injured against Ottawa, and we won't see him for the remainder of this season. Um, and Josh Morrissey really has been, you know, a guy of all of them that has stepped up and I think really shouldered quite a bit of that burden. But we've also seen along the line Pierre-Luc Dubois, Nikolai Ehlers as well, and certainly the guy that, for my opinion, is the conscience of this team, Paul Stastny, take a bigger role on that. And, you know, listen, I'm not pumping, you know, pushing for a big switch up of who's got the C and who's got the A and all that, but um, it can't be a one or two guy job. Um, And the sooner that those younger players, or that some of them aren't that young anymore, to be perfectly honest, are you know, able to really feel comfortable as leaders going forward into next season. And frankly, over the course of this offseason to prepare to avoid what happens this year, that makes the Winnipeg Jets a better hockey team. One thousand percent. You know, the the more integrated the full leadership group is, and that goes beyond the letters, um, the better Winnipeg will be. If you even look back to Winnipeg's most successful season in 2.0 franchise history, 2017-18, when they go deep as they do, I mean, Blake Wheeler is still the captain of that hockey team. Mark Scheifele is still an important part of the leadership group. And Josh Morrissey doesn't have an A yet, but he's an important young player as well. But there are so many different strong personalities on that team. You know, you could go to Dustin Bufflin. You could go to Paul Stastny of that era. You can go to Patrick Laine, um, the defense group with Tyler Myers as well. I mean, Jacob Truba. All of these guys were strong personalities in their own way. And I think that the fact that that strength was matched with quality on ice play as well um, speaks to the idea that Wheeler and Shifley can be part of a leadership group that wins. You know, it's not... I'm not looking at this as you got to throw those guys out. There's something horribly rotten with them. It's over if they're still part of the. I don't see it that way. But there does need to be a, a sense of integration, 
of their version of the Winnipeg Jets leadership and the young prime age players version of the Winnipeg leadership. Paul Stastny is such a remarkable player, uh, such a remarkable person as well to be that veteran voice that speaks calmly. And I think everybody admires. I think we're going to look back. And if we could be a fly on the wall of Jets dressing room conversations and think that that Paul Stastny re-signing was one of the best things that Winnipeg could have done last summer, I think that's a tremendously important thing. And then the last thing I'll say in what has turned into a rant, I mean, um, Nate Schmidt this morning as well told reporters at Matt Frost that you can't accept the idea of there's always next season. And he was talking about, hey, once you turn 30, there's this sense that, you know, you're on the back nine. You're, there's this sense that every year is crucial and vital and important. Well, if you have your captain saying that 30 is when you start to figure things out and you have a 30-year-old player saying, well, you're now on the back nine of your career and you have 25-year-old, 26-year-old stars who are driving the bus of the team's success, I see an incongruence there. And I think that folks need to get on the same page in that particular regard. And that can be done with the guys in the room if uh, if certain compromises and concessions or what have you are are, are made uh, and people do actually uh, make space for those young leaders that you just talked about. Well, I think you just nailed it. And Murad, I mean, that'll be one of the biggest conversations I think we have when it comes to, you know, who is leading this team on the bench next season as a head coach. Um, you know, someone that can come in and you know, sort of create, a, a, for all intents and purposes, a clean slate and empower those players to be you know, more of the solution as opposed to sort of taking cues from a couple of the more tenured veteran players on the club. Um, I want to talk about Dubois for a minute. First off, what did you, uh, what was your response or reaction to what we heard from Elliot Friedman on the weekend uh, regarding the, uh, the Dubois situation that freaked out a lot of people when they heard it from a Jets fan perspective at the start? Um, how, how did you interpret that? There is a certain sense of, oh, no, here we go again. That was my first response. By being honest, it was, oh, shit. Me too. Really? <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I, I mean, we, we can deal with the facts. Pierre-Luc Dubois uh, needs a new contract this summer. He's not far away from unrestricted free agency. He's had a phenomenal year. Um, you know, I think the last 15, 20 games, he hasn't been as, uh, as excellent as he was at the start, but he's still been good. Um, you know, Mark Scheifele has been excellent at times. Pierre-Luc Dubois has been excellent at times. Get them both going. You've got yourself a team. Pierre-Luc Dubois needs a contract. And I think that there's leverage in that. And I think that Winnipeg and Dubois both know how important he is to their future. And so that number, if it's going to be a long-term deal, could be substantial. I mean, I, I've heard folks and, and sources try to try to paint it as he won't get as much as Kyle Connor because he's not as special of a player uh, at his position as Connor is. I think at Pierre-Luc Dubois' age, the fact that he plays center, the importance that he um, that he uh, has within the Jets organization, the fact that Winnipeg worked forever to develop two strong centers, you know, the Stastny trade, the Kevin Hayes trade, Brian Little's injury was so unfortunate, um, all that sort of stuff. I think that he could command a very, very big contract figure. And I honestly think if you had asked me right now, I think he gets it. And I think he gets it from Winnipeg. And maybe we're looking at five years and the number starts with an eight. And that's going to be a, a, a very big number. And it could cause some conflict and some strife. Uh, but at the same time, eight million plus for a prime age 23 to 28 player is the that's the window where you want to be paying these guys, not well into their 30s as well. Uh, so I think that that's a situation to watch. I don't know what to make of it quite yet myself, how it's how it's going to end. But I still believe that Pierre-Luc Dubois is, is a Winnipeg Jet, and I still believe that he's worth a you know a fair bit and will get paid. Well, and and I mean, let's face it. I mean, we can't have this conversation without acknowledging that there is somewhat of uncertainty as to Mark Scheifele's future with the Winnipeg Jets, and. You know, if anything, and I mean, I certainly speculated that that, you know, that information's coming from somewhere. It's either coming from the team or coming from the players' side of things. And I don't know, I think that was maybe a bit of a public flex from uh, from an agent reminding people that, um, you know, there is some real negotiating power on the Dubois side of things. Uh, and, and it's, I think, magnified by the fact that, um, you know, there is quite a bit of there's the possibility that Mark Scheifele not a Winnipeg Jet next year. And if that's the case, it makes Dubois even more important than he already is to this organization, both next season and into the future. 
I mean, he's a central figure if you keep Mark Shifley. He is a paramount cornerstone, untouchable, must be a Winnipeg Jet for a long time player if you don't keep Mark Shifley. And without both of those two players, this is a blow it up and rebuild type of team. Like, I, I can't see a way where you lose Shifley and Pierre Luc Dubois and don't have a major rebuild on your hands, depending on the package. I mean, Shell Dayoff has done pretty well. When backed into a corner in the past, Jacob Truba, Evander Kane, uh, Andrew Kopp even more recently. So maybe I should hedge a little bit on that. But if you're missing both of your top two centers, that's that's catastrophic. That is a major, major issue. Um, and then, you know, just the fallout of all of that, too, would be would be substantial. So I agree with you. I think that's likely an agent-driven flex. And I think that Pierre-Luc Dubois is a, is a key player. I don't think Winnipeg needs to blow it up. I think they need to keep him and sort out the Mark Shifley situation. Because in my opinion, there is a Mark Shifley situation. And it's possible that that leads to a trade as soon as this summer. Could be next summer. Could be some type of uh, of change to role or what have you as well. Um, but to, to think that he is completely content or that everything has gone smoothly for him in the last little while, I think would be a little bit wishful as well. Yeah, and I mean, I know Friedman said that, you know, if there's not the ability to get a deal done, his name might be out there on the trade market. I Listen, I would be stunned if that happened at this point because it is important to note that, I mean, he still is under team control. I mean, it's not like he's an unrestricted free agent. So even if they can't get something done, um, they still have the ability to bring him back for a couple years. But certainly, I think for clarity, for... Um, you know, establishing Dubois as one of those young leaders that is a big, big part of the future. Um, you really have to do what it takes to get him done. I mean, preferably even beyond five years. I'm not sure whether it goes to seven or eight, but the bottom line is Pierre-Luc Dubois' prime years in his 20s um, being there consistently in the middle, whether it's in the one hole or the two hole at center ice in the Winnipeg Jets top six. Absolutely. That's that's the way that you can envision a championship or a playoff team. You need to have players in spots where they can outperform or at least match their contract in terms of production. And prime aged Pierre-Luc Dubois is a reasonably good bet for that. It's not overpaying that 30 year old, let's say Mark Shifley's next contract, for example, you know, 30 plus. If you go multiple years on that, I mean, that's a recipe for a long term overpay. We've seen Blake Wheeler even having a reasonably good middle six season at eight point two five million. That's un that's inefficient money. Um, for Pierre-Luc Dubois, there's a much better chance that that's efficient money. That's Kyle Connor, despite his defensive issues, which exist, and the fact that Winnipeg um, isn't a defensively strong team with him on the ice, that's a true thing. But guess what? In his prime, he can outscore that, and he's helping Winnipeg win. I think Pierre-Luc Dubois is similar from a cap management perspective, and it's the sort of position where once you have that sorted out, you can begin to imagine, well, okay, how are you slotting in Kyle Connor? How, you, how are you slotting in Cole Perfetti's emergence, uh, Chaz Lucius? Um, even Nik Nikolai Ehlers is an incredibly important player, which to my mind makes Paul Stastny important too because of the chemistry that they have. There's a lot of decisions that can be made with more confidence if Pierre-Luc Dubois is under contract for long term. Um, you know, Dubois has been mentioned as a potential player for Canada. It looks like Nikolai Ehlers is going to play in the World Championships. I mean, how many Jets do you think will actually maybe suit up for their nations at the event? And um, I mean, considering the disappointment of this season, they plan to be playing in the playoffs and hopefully for a long time. Um, what do you think the benefits are of players like that in prominent roles of the, of, for the Winnipeg Jets playing in the World Championships, unfortunately, because they're available? I mean, from a bird's eye level, looking at it from far away, I think the more the better, the more different scenarios that these players can step into and possibly have success. I mean, there's a lot of really good American players on the Jets. There's good Canadian players on the Jets and international as well. They're going to go to some good teams. They're going to go to a situation that's a nice tournament structure. Nikolai Ehlers was talking about it to reporters today. That That's going to be a, a good experience for a lot of folks. Uh, I think that that would have value for these guys to demonstrate um, to demonstrate just kind of a commitment to their games in a sense, but to their countries as well. I think that that's an important thing that gives a lot of people a lot of value. At the same time, if you zoom in a little bit, there's some situations where world championship caliber players might 
be best suited not playing. And Neil Pionk talked about a nagging injury. So I think he, I mean, he said he's not going to play. He's going to rest up until that's fully healed. Cole Perfetti, you know, I I would have loved to see him at the Worlds, but I think that there's still maybe some work to be done on that front. It looks like they're setting a, an August slash September timeline for really rounding into form heading into next season as a Winnipeg Jet. Uh, there's players like that. I wonder about Mark Scheifele. I mean, certainly since he's not playing right now, I'm anticipating another few weeks on that shoulder for, for reasons like that. Blake Wheeler, probably as you know, the 35 year old player that he is, it's probably going to be completely up to him. And I wouldn't be surprised if he chooses rest as well, though. I think that that would be an interesting one to watch and you can go on and on and on one guy who I'm certainly hoping will play. And I, I, I mean, if there's confirmation of, about this, I don't know it. Kyle Connor, I think would be, uh, would be tremendous to, to see on that stage. And you just like to see in a situation like that with Connor, where he's had a tremendous year and, um, there's a lot of good vibes around Kyle Connor right now. And I think he's getting recognition from outside of the city, which is nice to see. Um, I think that that could be a really special time for him to, to reunite with some players that he grew up playing with as well. So between him and Ehlers, those are the two players I'm, I'm really pinning my hopes on the most in that sort of regard. Yeah, I sure wouldn't mind seeing Morrissey and Dubois uh, lace up for Canada as well yes, and uh, be able to too. cheer those guys on. Hey, one quick thing on Connor. You mentioned, I mean, we've discussed in the past, I mean, his defensive words. We haven't talked, and I've been very impressed at how he's transitioned into an effective penalty killer this year um, under Dave Lowry. Um, but, as I mean, you look, look into the numbers, and I'll put you on the spot if you don't have this, it's cool. But has his defensive play improved or is he just so dynamic offensively and scoring so many goals? We don't pay attention to it as much anymore. It's not as much of an issue. I see it more the second way, if I'm being completely honest. Um, I think that, first of all, defensive impact at five on five and on the PK are two wildly different things because so much of the PK is spent in structure. So there is neutral zone defense trying to stop that zone entry. And then there's some scramble plays to be sure, but also there's being in structure uh, with the game kind of in front of you, they have less reads to make over their shoulders. They have less backdoor plays, all those sorts of things. So there are fewer decisions to make in a way on the PK. And there's a lot of players who can have tremendous impact on the penalty kill. And certainly with Kyle Connor's speed, my goodness, the offense he can create as well. That might not necessarily be great five on five players from a defensive point of view. And I think that that's where he is right now in his career. He's certainly outscoring defensive issues from a metrics point of view, more so than he's improved his defensive impact. And then the question becomes why? Where does that come from? Where are those defensive issues? And you can break down video, and I've seen people do this, and I've done a little bit of it myself, where Kyle Connor genuinely does sometimes look lost in the defensive zone. Uh, there's one play I saw going around Twitter where off a defensive zone draw, he seemed not to know where uh, which, which person was his, and he floated for a little bit. Um, back checking, he's pretty good at, but then identifying the player and, and sort of winning the physical battle that comes out of that, not as sure. But Winnipeg as a team right now is struggling to sort out the winger's role on defense. Since Dave Lowry came in, systems have mostly been the same, but they've asked wingers to collapse down low a little bit more often than Paul Maurice's version of the Jets did. And that's still a work in progress. We know that there's issues all over that team in terms of defensive impact. So Kyle Connor, I would say, is still a part of it. And then sussing out exactly how big his role is, is an issue as well. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say in terms of sussing out how big his role is, he's certainly a dangerous player in transition, but there are plays at the blue lines in terms of making sure that puck gets broken out that have led to goals against for the Winnipeg Jets this season. Uh, and and there's, those are the sorts of things that you would anticipate as he continues to grow. Just a little bit better puck management and better puck support from teammates should be able to help him a little bit, but I don't think it's ever going to be the absolute strength of his game. Murat Atesh of The Athletic with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Before we go, Murat, um, you uh, have always done the fan survey at the end of the season. I think we all knew what was coming from fans right now, but uh, what are you hearing right now? And uh, when will when will we see all the gory details of just how cantankerous this fan base has become based on the season that's uh, just coming to an end? I mean, yeah, we were talking <laughs> about this. We, we were messaging back and forth about this, and... Uh, I think it's fair to say fans are frustrated. We're getting some of the most lengthy, cantankerous is a great word, um, detailed descriptions of what the Winnipeg Jets 
uh, have done to you as fans, but uh, also need to do going forward as well. And I love the engagement. We're on pace to set a record in terms of, I think we actually already passed the record in terms of how many people have filled this out. So that's great. Could be the fact that we have more subscribers. We're always growing. But I think also the biggest driver is that folks have a lot to say. And there are a lot of opinions about where it went wrong, um, what needs to be done, who the solutions will be. And so I'm going to put that all together. I've been sifting through it. Probably going to have to make it a two-parter because there's so much good stuff. You don't say. <laughs> you don't say. Yeah. Um, and right now the target date is Friday, Saturday. So um, look for as as the weekend approaches to, to really see. I'll present the data. I'll put all of your answers up. Um, and I'll definitely pick the, some of the most insightful or fiery or um, interesting takes. And I'll, and I'll highlight those quotes too. Well, I'll, I'll say this about it. I'm not at all surprised you've got record feedback on this. And again, folks, go to The Athletic. I mean, it's up there right now. I'm sure you still got some time to get uh, your feedback back to Marat on this. Um, but it does show that these people care. Um, you know, the worst thing that can happen, and we were worried about that. You know, you get from anger to apathy. Um, I'm not sure we're entirely there as of yet, but um, I'm sure the responses that you're getting, and we see it and hear it every day here in the chat on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily, um, the fans are still engaged um, and they care um, and they expect more as we've heard from a number of the players and it's just a matter of figuring out how to make that happen. Really looking forward to uh, seeing it on Friday and Saturday, Marat, and we'll look forward to talking to you next week about the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs and of course the to-do list going into the offseason for Winnipeg Jet Management at the end of 82. Hey, I look forward to all of that, picking it apart. And you're right. The engagement is crazy good. And the passion is there. There is no apathy. I, I even put that as a poll answer. Like, do you feel apathetic? And the apathy is low. The engagement is high. The desire to see success is high. And I mean, so thank you. Thank you to you for giving us the chance to talk. And then thank you to everybody out there who's filling this out. And who, and who cares? Because that's what makes... Even after an awful, se awful, disappointing, underwhelming season, that's what makes this stuff good to do on our part. That's for sure. Great having you back on the program. Uh, sorry to hear about the basement. Best of luck getting all that straightened out. And uh, have a good few days, end of the season, and we'll look forward to catching up next week. Thank you. There it is, Marat Atash at WPG Marat on Twitter. And uh, you can check out all Marat's work at The Athletic. All right, Bob Herrick is coming up, and I do want to get to Nikolai Ehlers. Uh, before we do that, a big shout-out to our friends at Breezy Bend Country Club. Cannot wait to get the course open and uh, get out onto the course this year if you're thinking about an incredible home for you and your family's golf future. Talk to Corey Johnson at Breezy Bend about how you can get on the course this year, potentially, or in the future. BreezyBend.ca as well for all the information on the course. And give him a follow on Instagram right now. Uh, great Instagram contest as we uh, wait for the course and all the courses in and around Manitoba to open. Uh, our friends at Not Auto Corp are ready for summer. and. You know, you may have been thinking about getting a new car or you may just need one because the Winnipeg potholes have eaten up your current vehicle. Whatever you're looking for, not will get you into the car of your dreams at a great price. So why not head down to Waverly and McGill for you to check out our friends there. You can find out more about the Tesla experience as well. Find out more. They've been a leader in the electric vehicle market for a number of years here in Winnipeg, uh, as well as all the great cars on the lot. And if there's some... The particular make and model that you've got your eyes set on, talk to the experts at Knot, and they will help you find it. And, of course, a big cheers to our friends at Little Brown Jug, who took home the uh, favorite local beer at the Winnipeg Nightlife Awards on the weekend. Of course, uh, Little Brown Jug been a great sponsor of ours dating back to last year. And one of our favorites to enjoy as well, that great taste in 1919. You can pick it up and find restaurants and bars throughout the city. Uh, of course, beer stores, liquor marts as well. But the best spot to do it is pop down and visit them on William Avenue. And check them out on Instagram as well. We've got all sorts of neat events. And there's a trivia event going on this week. And uh, more things going on in the patio as the weather finally breaks and we get into spring. You can also order for home delivery online at littlebrownjug.ca. And just before we get to Nikolai Ehlers, cannot wait to get out to Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge this summer. And uh, we'll get out there for a few days. They are still, it's going to be their busiest summer ever based on 
you know, making up for lost trips over the last couple of years due to the pandemic. Uh, but they are still looking for a couple of university students uh, to work for the summer. And I can tell you, it is, uh, imagine spending four months in paradise with an incredible group of people led by Pitt to Ren. Uh, so find out more online at akinslake.com or you can hit Pitt up on Instagram at Aikens Lake to uh, get a resume in and uh, maybe we'll see you out at Aikens Lake this summer. All right, Bob Herrig coming up for the uh, SI Golf Writer has a book about the incredible rivalry uh, between Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson. Um, so we'll get to that in just a few minutes, but we kind of promised Nikolai Ehlers earlier in the show. We got talking moose with Dan Fink and Rot came on. Um, so let's do this right now. Nikolai Ehlers um, was you know, fielding a number of questions today, but had a pretty lengthy answer on the overall disappointment of this season. Uh, had a number of guys come in already the last few days just with some reflections on the season that was and lots of candid assessments of the frustration and the, the um, underachieving I guess so uh, how would you summarize I guess with three games left still but how would you summarize this this year as a whole uh, a lot of things have been said already um you know, waste it is, is obviously one of them. Um, I think we came in here with uh, we came in here with a belief that you know we we knew we were gonna be a, a playoff team. You know, that's I think that's how we came into training camp. It was just a matter of you know having the right mentality, playing the right way doing all the small things right and uh, you know I, I, I think you know when you look back now in this league you got to be you got to be a little more humble than that because um, this is not an, an easy league to, to, to play in um, to get wins in so we didn't do all those small things right um, we didn't play enough good games obviously or else we wouldn't be sitting here right now. So that's on us. That's on no one else. It's it's on us to, to play hockey and, and win games. And, you know, yeah, we had injuries. Yeah, we had guys out with COVID. But every other team in this league has that every single year. So um, there are really no excuses for us to be in the situation that we're in right now. You look back, I, mean, I think it was mid-November, you guys had just beaten Edmonton, you're 9-3-3, nine, three, and three. you were right there at the top of the central, and then, like, is there anything you can now look back on and say, geez, it all changed when this happened or that happened? Because uh, it, it seems like things really kind of went south from that point. Yeah, I mean, you look at our team, we have a, we have a great team. You know, we have a lot of skill, we have young guys, we have older guys. Um, you know, I, I think we have on paper what it takes to be a, a playoff team, but, you know, a lot of teams that are not in the playoffs right now have that. Um, it's a matter of, you know, playing the right way and, and doing all the small things and, and playing with the right mindset and, and, you know, being ready for every single game. Yeah, we you know we did start pretty good, but it's it's still an, an 82 game season. So you know if if you play 15 games the right way, that's not going to be enough for you. Um, and you know we uh, we just didn't play to our best. Um, we did a couple of games, but that's not going to do it for you. All right, there's Nikolai Ehlers and some of his comments before tonight's game against the Philadelphia Flyers. Of course, we'll have more time to discuss that in the coming days and certainly on Monday when we hear from the Winnipeg Jets cleaning out the lockers and uh, going their separate ways for the summer after not qualifying for the Stanley Cup playoffs. I'm really excited about this next conversation. Been a fan of uh, Bob Herrig's work for a long time uh, during his time with ESPN, even the Tampa Bay Times, now at SI.com. 
golf writer Bob Herrick with a new book that just came out yesterday, Golf's Most Fascinating Rivalry, Tiger and Phil. And Bob Herrick joins us now. Bob, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. How are you? I'm doing well, Andrew. Thank you for having me. It was interesting to listen to that con hockey conversation for a minute. I'm in the Tampa area and course our team's been doing great and now everybody's nervous again because the playoffs are about to start but uh, thank you for having me yeah lightning you're looking like a beast going in there's a lot of maple Leafs fans that are hoping to win their first series in 18 years and then yeah. sees the back-to-back -back defending champs coming up on the docket for next week and are certainly some nervous moments um bob <laughs> it goes without saying i mean tiger woods and phil mickelson two of the biggest stars in sports and certainly in the history of golf you've had the opportunity to cover them interview them for a long time Tell us how the how the book came together. Yeah, well, it actually the the seeds of it were planted, I think, right after Tiger won the Masters in 2019. I mean, it just such a great victory and such a you know historic achievement and and all that he did uh, to to win that tournament. Uh, you know, coming back from what he did, I just thought that it was worth kind of exploring some more. And then I got to thinking, well, you know, we might be at the end of this reign of Tiger and Phil, you know, and actually later that summer for the first time ever, Tiger and Phil playing in the same major at the open at uh, Royal Portrush, uh, both missed the cut. It, it had never happened before. And so it kind of got me thinking, you know, I wonder if we're sort of at the end with these guys. And I wanted to, instead of just doing on one or the other, I thought it would be kind of neat to chronicle how their careers intersected, going all the way back to when they were kids. And really, it's pretty amazing how often they did intersect, despite Tiger having the much better record, obviously. You know, Phil has the next best record, and nobody's close to Phil. You know, and when you, when you deep, dive deep into it, you know, there was a little tension between them over the years. There was some friction. There was some, you know, they weren't always buddies. I'm not sure they're buddies today. Uh, but, uh, you know, it actually it actually turned out OK, where it's sort of, I think, a, a nice, you know, capturing of history between the two of them and, and what they've accomplished in golf. Um, well, we'll get to Phil in a minute. I probably want to focus in on Tiger. But just, you know, overall, how would you characterize the rivalry that you speak about and write about in the book and how it sort of changed over the years? Because it certainly did seem like it was in a different place a couple of years ago than maybe it was 10 or 15 years ago when they were going head to head all the time. Right. I mean, look, the records would suggest you could make the argument, well, Tiger had no rival. I mean, Tiger, uh, you know, his rival might have been Jack Nicholas or history or whatever. But, you know, if you go back and look, uh, there were several instances in time where they were both such prominent parts of, of the golf scene. Uh, you know, as far back as 1999, they played together in the third round of the U.S. Open, the one that Payne Stewart beat Phil Mickelson at. But Tiger was very much in the mix of that. In 01, Tiger and Phil played in the last round together at the Masters. Tiger going for a fourth straight major championship. What if Phil would have won that, which he very easily could have? He was, you know, he was right there through about 13 or 14 holes. That would have been wild if that is his first major blocking Tiger. Uh, when, Ty when Phil finally won one in 04, you know, Tiger kind of realized he's going to be a threat. They did. They traded green jackets for a couple of years. They were back and forth, a great du duel at Doral. There was not always a lot of love between them. And that softened over time. You know, that softened. When Tiger was out with all the back problems, I think he gained a lot of perspective. Uh, he learned that, uh, you know, that, that it was beyond the blinders that he had always put on. He appreciated Phil reaching out to him to help with his chipping when that was bad. They collaborated on, on the Ryder Cup and the President's Cup in 16 and 17 and even 18. They both played in it. T terrible loss for the U.S., but they both played. Uh, so, and, and then, of course, they had that match. So I think I think part of that was a commercial reason for getting along. Where they stand now is hard to say because what's been going on in golf with the rival leagues and Phil kind of siding with that and Tiger definitely on the side of the PGA Tour um, makes me wonder if the frostiness isn't back. Uh, but it sure was there, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. There was, um, there was plenty, of, plenty of, you know, it was just a little bit of angst between them uh, for a long period of time. Um, as far as Tiger goes right now in the present, um, you know, his comeback and just being able to play 72 holes at the Masters was 
I mean, a victory in its own right. And I think it mm -hmm. just speaks to the incredible will that Tiger Woods has that he was able to play and, you know, through obviously ailing as you got through the tournament, still finishing it up um, as he intended to. What did you make of Tiger's performance at the Masters? And the fact that he did that, could we see another 72-hole performance from Tiger Woods at Southern Hills in the PGA Championship coming up shortly? Yeah, I think you have to. I think you have to look at it as a huge accomplishment, as you said, as a win in its own right. Can't worry too much about the scores. I mean, seventy-eight both Saturday and Sunday. Unfortunately, those are his highest scores ever at the Masters, and that includes back when he was, um, you know, an amateur. His highest previously had been seventy-seven when he was an amateur. Uh, but I mean. Should we really be surprised? I mean, it's, it was remarkable that he shot under par the first day. It was remarkable that he played all 72 holes. He was there for a week. He prepared. He played nine holes three of the four days. He, he practiced the other day. Um, and we saw that he was laboring at the end. Uh, the encouraging thing uh, that you take from it, I think, is, is he said afterward there's room for improvement. I mean, if this was the best his leg was ever going to be, then I'm not so sure – that going forward, this is going to be an easy thing. I think uh, had it been any other tournament, Tiger doesn't come back then. He probably would have been better off waiting a month. Things would have gotten stronger. But that leads me to believe that there's a good chance that he'll play the PGA at Southern Hills. Uh, he's had time to, uh, you know, obviously rest and recuperate. And now you think that probably by this point, he's trying to uh, ramp it back up again, gear back up to play. And, and, and all that entails. And then part of that is the rehab and the strengthening of the leg. And, and obviously, Southern Hills isn't anywhere near as strenuous of a walk as Augusta National. That, that was the other crazy thing. You couldn't come back at a harder place to walk. So I think it's all encouraging what went on there. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a decent shot he'll be at uh, Southern Hills. You know, he did say he's going to play the Open this summer. Um, how much he can play between now and then, I think, is what he's trying to weigh. You know, because if you play one and you have a setback, that's not good. On the other hand, you kind of need to play to be competitive. You, you need to get out there inside the ropes. You just cannot simulate it. So it's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out. Well, and you mentioned the Open Championship at St. Andrews, which is one of Tiger's favorite courses. And, you know, because of the schedule, this in all likelihood, I mean, <laughs> listen, I'd love to be wrong, but is probably the last real competitive, um, you know, elite open championship rounds Tiger Woods will have at, uh, at St. Andrews. And I mean, that will be special for Tiger. It'll be special for the tournament, uh, but for golf in general, because of the history that Tiger's made at that historic course. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, I think that's, that's a, it, it, if he, if he does go back there, you know, we're probably at least five, six years away from, from the, the open going back to St. Andrews. You know, that puts him in his 50s. You know, who knows where he will be at that point in his career. Listen, for all we know, Tiger is right now plotting to try to become the oldest major champion and knock Phil off of that, <laughs> off that record. You know, because think about it. Tiger was very understated about trying to come back at the Masters. Clearly, way, way, way before we knew it. And when he was downplaying it, he had it in his mind that he was going to try to play there. At some point in the process, he set it as a goal. When that was, it would be interesting if he would ever tell us. Was it when he played with his son, Charlie, at the father's son in December? Did he say to himself then, I'm going to try to play the Masters? Of course, he never let that on. But clearly, he had to set it as a goal early to try to work toward it. So you could see him in the back of his mind going, you know what? I'm going to try to make sure I'm competitive at age 50. I'm going to beat that record that Phil set. And, and again, you know, it sort of points out, it's funny how – uh, you know, I wrote this book sort of with the idea that we might be near the end. I left open the idea that there might be more, but that was unrealistic. But yet we might not be at the end. You know, if Phil can can get things back together and 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 be out there playing in majors, there's no reason why he couldn't win a Masters or an Open again as well. Well, and, and just before we get to Phil, uh, what I find interesting about Tiger and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a different a change in personality. A big part of that is his family. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Charlie. And you mentioned, I mean, seeing Tiger and, and, and Charlie play together in that event was just so cool. I'm sure the ratings for that were probably better than just about anything normally on the PGA Tour. But 
got to ask you, as a father, and knowing how into golf and how talented Charlie is, how much do you think that is a driving force of keeping Tiger Woods active and uh, as, as close to the top of his game as he can be for the foreseeable future, Bob? I think it's a great point. I mean, he has some incentive to sort of stay active and relevant as it relates to his son and, and his daughter to show them, you know, resiliency and, and, and things, you know, and things like determination. And, and obviously they know what he's going through at home and, and it's, you know, he's maybe trying to set an example and his son is into golf. And I think there's nothing that Charlie likes more than seeing his dad playing golf and his dad playing golf. Well, and and that's a that's a great goal carrot out there for Tiger. I remember before the car crash, I wrote that. I, I thought that 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 his son's own interest in golf was a great motivator for Tiger. I mean, it was a great motivator from the sense of, hey, I want to show him I can still beat these guys. And oh, by the way, I I better keep up, or he's going to be beating me one of these days, and I don't want that to happen anytime soon. So I think there's a lot to that point, and. Uh, and it, uh, it, and it might sustain him here for a while. Bob Herrig is our guest. The uh, book is called Golf's Most Fascinating Rivalry, Tiger and Phil. It was just released yesterday, and we spent some time talking about Tiger. But, I mean, to me, Phil's the fascinating person right now today. If you had told me, Bob, last year when Phil won the PGA and became the oldest major champion ever, and Tiger was recovering from, let's face it, a car crash where some people were wondering whether he was going to be walking normally for, at, at any point in his life. He would have told me that we'd be having this conversation today talking about Tiger Woods playing the Masters and Phil being a ghost in the golf world. You would have wondered, well, how, how in the world is this possible? I mean, Phil has essentially gone underground. I mean, w what has happened with Phil? Where is he? What's going on? And what is the future for Phil Mickelson? in the world of professional golf, PGA Tour, North America? Think of the odds you could have gotten huh. on January 15th that said, Tiger's going to play the Masters and Phil won't. It would have, it, it would have had to have been, what, 1,000 to 1? It was preposterous <laughs> to think that at that point. I mean, it, maybe they'd be lower on Tiger playing, but you wouldn't have ever thought Phil wouldn't. You know, coming off a major, you know, all the glory of that. He, he's still competitive. He's still at the time in the top 50 in the world. And as you said, it was the other way around. It, Phil, you know, he emerged a little bit the other day. His agent put out a statement saying that he had entered the PGA Championship. Doesn't mean he'll play it, but he entered. It was procedural. He had to do that. Obviously, he's entered the U.S. Open as well for the same reason. The deadlines for both those tournaments have passed. And he was also requesting a release for the Live Golf Invitational Series event outside of London in June, which to me means that Phil is not going to go crawling back to the PJ Tour asking for forgiveness for all of this stuff that's going on and caused all this controversy. Because if you're asking for permission to play in that event, that suggests that while you might not be going full bore into that endeavor, you're not completely distancing yourself from it either. And I would have thought the PGA Tour, you know, to get totally have Phil, you know, back in their good graces, they would have wanted him to disassociate himself with that completely. That did not happen. Now it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. Phil still has not said anything in, you know, now we're almost going on three months since, uh, well, well, actually, it's, it's been a little more than, it's been, a, it's been about two months since the end of February is when he released the statement, the apology that wasn't a full apology and, you know, said he was going to step away. He's lost endorsements. Frankly, some of that's surprising to me. Um, you know, Phil did have a pretty good 30 year track record. Not everybody's perfect, but he was pretty good, you know, did a lot for the game. Very, you know, fan friendly, all that sort of stuff, a lot of charitable stuff. And this stuff is just in a heartbeat turned, turned the whole story around you know, hurt his legacy to some degree, hurt his reputation. Um, you know, obviously where the money's coming from, the Saudi-backed uh, league o over there, it, it, that hasn't helped. Uh, it's, a, it's really amazing to think that less than a year ago, he became the oldest major champion. That should have been the legacy-defining moment of his career. Frankly, something he could have lived off of forever. And here we are wondering if he'll even play. 
Well, and, and what's incredible is that, you know, I mean, the legacy defining moment right now that people are talking about was his comments about the Saudis that, I mean, rubbed everyone the wrong way. And your comments about the sponsorship, I thought were, were bang on. I, I was absolutely stunned when I heard like KPMG that had been on that shirt and the hat for so long was walking away because Phil Mickelson, part of his brand was being the man of the people, was being as marketable an athlete that there was. Um, and we knew he likes money too. So, I mean, there's a big, big cost to it as well. But I, I mean, to me, that was when it really became real, Bob, that people that had been with him for so long through so many ups and downs and mostly ups with his incredible career were walking away at this point because of what had been reported that had come out of his mouth, not anything to right. do with, you know, anything on the golf course. Right, Andrew. And I mean, there's a couple of things in play there, I think. One is he, he was critical of both sides. You know, let's be honest. The, you know, he was crit highly critical of the PGA Tour. And while he might have had a point or two, his comments were quite severe. I mean, calling, you know, referring to obnoxious greed. What's more obnoxiously greedy than talking to a, a rival entity with, you know, where they're dangling, you know, nine figure guarantees in front of you, you know, so that that didn't come off right. Then the, then the quotes that, you know, that were attributed to him that are that are for another book in which he claims afterward he did not mean to have said on the record. But still, he was very critical of the Saudi regime. He, was, he, he admitted, though, that it was worth it to use them to gain leverage. So by doing that, by criticizing Saudi, KPMG has a big interest in Saudi Arabia. They have, you know, they have, a, they have offices there. They, they do business there. So I think their distancing themselves from him had to do with his comments about them. Callaway probably more on the side of him being so negative towards the PGA Tour. Uh, you know, he, 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 ended up, he ended up angering both sides. And, and instead of currying favor with both sides. And uh, yet I still find it surprising that they didn't stick with them and say, let's see how this thing plays out. You know, Phil maybe could have saved himself. Maybe there could, everybody's allowed another chance, right? You can apologize. You can move on. I, I'm sorry. I, you know, whatever. And, and yet that happened so swiftly. And, you know, the irony is, is in trying to enhance his bottom line, he severely hurt it. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, Bob, this has been a great conversation. Just quickly on the way out, what do you think? When, let's say Phil does play one of these events that you mentioned, the PGA Championship or the U.S. Open. When Phil finally speaks, what do you think we're going to hear from Mr. Mickelson? It's a great question. Frankly, I think Phil needs to, if he's going to play the PGA Championship, I think he needs to speak before that. I mean, are you going to hijack the PGA Championship? I mean, you know, it can't be helped if you're if it's Tiger coming back or you know, Phil's a hot player, but if, if it's going to, if that's going to become the huge story because we're waiting for his first words on this, I'm not sure that's a great idea, you know, and what is he going to say? I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, part of him, you know, leaving the door open to the live golf event is, is curious to me because as I said earlier, I don't think he has a, a, a way fully back to the PGA tour if he does that. Now, if he comes out and says, Hey, look, I just want to try it out. I want to see what this new format is all about. I, you know, I, I love the PGA Tour. They've been great to me. I don't think, you know, I have no, I, I don't understand why we can't do both. If he wants to take that tact, um, then maybe there is a way back. Because I think that's a legitimate thought process for the players. Is why, and that's what Greg Norman, who, you know, leads the, that league, is saying is, why can't they do both? You know, obviously the tour has rules about competing events, but I think that's what the crux of this is. You know, there's the, do, do you have the ability to play something else as a professional? And, uh, and I think if Phil words that properly, you know, maybe he has a chance to rebound, but unfortunately, you know, I think there's some people out there have already made up their mind and they're, they're they aren't going to change. No doubt about it. Bob, listen, thanks so much for taking the time. I cannot wait to read the book. It is out uh, yesterday. I imagine Amazon and pretty much anywhere you yep. get books, uh, people will find it on the shelves. Um, uh, it's going to be a great read uh, by uh, you know an incredibly experienced writer in yourself and two of the most uh, famous and interesting personalities in the history of the sport. Thank you so much for doing this, Bob, and uh, all the best. Uh, you're very kind, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. 
Appreciate it. There is Bob Herrick. The book, as I mentioned, Golf's Most Fascinating Rivalry, Tiger and Phil, available now. All right, we got to get Remus in here. I want to talk about this NHL player poll. We do got to get to cool bet lines for today. Of course, a big thanks to our friends at Princess Auto for their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. And, hey, we did the curling reports all year long. There still is a little bit of curling. Shout out to uh, Peterman and Gallant, who are on their way to the playoffs at the World Mixed Curling Championships, representing Canada. And of course, Princess Auto getting ready for bomber season. They had the Great Grey Cup Tour. Well, it's just about time to get back to the stadium, and Princess Auto will be the sponsor and welcome all bomber fans to the pregame tailgates before all bomber games this season. Of course, Princess Auto is the spot where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Two Winnipeg locations. You can shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Our friends at Nick and Nicky DQ are ready for a little bit nicer weather. But in the meantime, their burgers, the new Stack Burgers, are phenomenal 12 months a year. I already thought the DQ had one of the best burgers in the game, um, but they're even better right now. Try one, and while you're there, pick up an amazing blizzard treat at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQs, DQ Northgate, DQ Niverville, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. Uh, the, all Winnipeg locations available on all the delivery apps as well. If you just want to get it ordered in and delivered to your spot, and uh, don't forget, at DQ Manitoba on Instagram, or uh, your ability to order a cake in advance, get a custom made and pick it up quick and easy at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQs. Of course, playoffs start next week. Boston Pizza is going to be the place to be. All the games on all the screens. No better place to get together with the gang for the big game than Boston Pizza. You can try those gourmet pizzas, Boston's wings, ice cold schooners. And if you're staying at home, bostonpizza.com for all their game day deals and you can order online. And uh, I will say this, the CC and ginger ale, this is going to be the drink of the summer. Had a chance to finally try it on the weekend, and it is as advertised. Phenomenal, and uh, hey, you don't, have to, you don't have to mix it yourself. Ready to go, six packs of cans, singles as well, available at your local beer stores or liquor marts. And if you're in Manitoba liquor marts, check out the CC display at 26 of the biggest stores this month for a free can with any purchase of Canadian Club. All right, let's get Michael Remus back in here. That was a great conversation with Bob Herrig. I'm so looking forward to reading that book. Um, you know, Bob's covered Tiger and Phil for so many years, uh, interviewed them a number of times, but, um, you know, with where they're both at their career, will be great. Great conversation, of course, brought in the Fink as well. Uh, but Remo, you were very excited today before the show to get the results of the NHL PA player poll. Uh, what did you think? I'm always interested in these player polls. You know, you get to hear the consensus, who the players think is the best player, the best goalie, maybe some even some off uh, stuff. If you want to rip through it real quick here, I can I can bring it up. Should I just open it or what? Yeah, yeah, sure. Open okay. it up. I mean, I will say just quickly, we'll get to all around. There was not really much mention of Winnipeg no. with the exception of one thing. Shout out to the gang that does the ice at Canada Life Center. Um, player poll says that Canada Life Center, the third best ice in the National Hockey League. And I can't say it's surprising that all top three our Canadian buildings, Bell Center run away with it with just about 40% of the vote. Rogers plays second and Canada Life Center third place. Interestingly, Vegas came in at fourth along with the XL Energy Center. Uh, but that was basically the lone bit of Jets content in the NHLPA uh, player pool. Yeah, this was the only Jets content as I uh, scroll on looking for it here. 12.2% uh, of the players and someone commented, uh, and my, I threw this out on Twitter. Hey, they were third best ice. And someone's like, well, that's just because the Jets suck this year and they come in and win and they don't have a four check. Well, I was like, well, actually, you know, I'm like, well, actually, you know, every year they've done this uh, player poll, the Jets have had the third best ice, including the years when they went to the uh, playoffs in the Western Conference. Bad take, final. bad so, take. So that theory uh, has been debunked. As miserable as the Jets season has been, uh, I don't think that impacted the voting. Uh, so there you go. That's some math. For me, we can just go through these if you want. Uh, on ice, if you need to win one game, who's the one goalie you want? I'm going with the Conn Smythe Trophy winner, Andre Vasilevsky. Carey Price, who hasn't even really played much this year until recently, he's second. Um, other goalies, Fleury, Gibson, 
Then you get Markstrom, Quick, Soros. So those are the No others. love for Hellebuck. That's BS. No love. No love. We'll get people are asking about Winnipeg's Wi-Fi rating. Don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna get to that. That's gonna get mentioned. <laughs> gonna get mentioned later. If you need to win one game, who is the one skater you'd want on your team? McDavid getting the most, 42%. Crosby, a lot of still, you know, he's getting older, but uh, a lot of respect for him, 17%. And then you have Hedman, only defenseman on the list who's having a monster season. You know, it's funny, it's, you don't see Makar or Yossi on there. Hedman, he just had 80 points. He's, the Lightning are on fire. I know uh, we just talked to Bob, oh. who's in Tampa. I got Stamkos in fantasy, 21 points in his last seven games. Hopefully he can carry me to the fantasy championship. But there's Barkov, you hear, hear him as two-way in. You know, Nathan McKinnon, one of the top players as well. Um, all centers, actually, all the forwards. Uh, no one no one had a winger. Uh, something just pointing this out. Best stick handler, Pat Kane, then McDavid. Brad running away with it, 57% yeah. of the vote. Connor McDavid second at 22, and really it was just those two guys. I mean, Nate McKinnon got 5%, but, I mean, essentially those two players took about three-quarters of the entire votes. Yeah, pretty pretty interesting, and I'm not, I mean, these are all top players in the league, so no, like, major surprises here. Best passer, Dreisaitl and Kane. Uh, that Nicholas, surprised me. That, that surprised me. I, like the, I mean, listen, no disrespect to Leon Dreisaitl at all, and I guess I would have put him in that conversation, but um, I was very surprised to see him at the top, although it was quite close. 17.7% for Dreisaitl, 156 for Kane. 15.4 for Nicholas Backstrom, who certainly has been uh, a big part of Alex Ovechkin's run at Gretzky's record. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Backstrom, not a big scorer, but in terms of passing, uh, one of the top guys. Uh, which player do you wish you could shoot like? Ovechkin, 53%, uh, pretty incredible. Matthews, Mr. 60 goals, uh, 24%. And there's Patrick Laine for the only, the closest thing we can get to a Jets player on this player poll is Line at 3.4%. And then you got Stamkos, Kucherov, Pasternak. It's amazing how many Lightning players are on here. Stamkos, Kucherov, <laughs> Hedman, all named. Vasilevsky, all, all named. And that's why they're back-to-back -back Stanley Cup champions. Is a, yeah, no, no, better, no better opportunity to uh, show everyone what you can do uh, than uh, when everyone else is finished and you're playing for championships. And that basically <laughs> has been the case. And speaking of Tampa, one of the other interesting ones that was... The, uh, you know, who, which non NHL athlete would you like to trade places for a day? Uh, speaking of winners, Tom Brady tops that list at 18.3. Then it's Tiger, LeBron James, Roger Federer, and Cristiano Ronaldo. Pretty good choices, I would say, by members of the NHLPA in that category. Yeah, that was, that was a good one here. We do have most complete player Crosby, Barkov, Bergeron. I mean, you always hear about their two way games. Uh, McDavid and Copa are no surprise. Best ice who went over that. Okay, this is the everyone the one everyone laughed at us. Who is the player you least enjoy playing against but would like to have on your team? <laughs> Brad Marchand, number one. No 20, doubt about it. And then <laughs> McDavid. I guess just because he's you know he's the best player, so you don't like playing against him. But uh, Tom Wilson, I guess uh, as well, the guy you don't want to play against. And then Hedman and and McKinnon. I mean, McKinnon's yeah, done some dirty stuff uh, this year. Us. He's been in a couple incidents, a couple dust. Yeah, things. no, he uh, he has for sure. Okay, and just one final one we'll get to uh, is uh, which NHL player has the best hockey hair? Another terrible omission of Kyle Connor, who's really come into his own in the hair game. But it's Cody Eakin with the red mullet who takes it at 8.9%. William Carlson, Eric Carlson, John Merrill, and of course... Our guy, Brandon Tan of the Seattle Kraken, cracking the top five. That was sort of a, a funny one that they put out. But uh, Eakin getting the respect for the lid around the National Hockey League. You can check it all out at sure. NHLPA on Twitter. Yeah, Kyle. I thought Kyle Connor should have been in there. Tan of former Jet on the list. One other thing, best NHL road city to spend an off day. Vegas one, New York two. We were both expecting, you know, the next question when I was scrolling down. Uh, which NHL road city is the worst to spend an off day? And you're going to see Winnipeg, Buffalo. No airport. Edmonton. Shitty Wi-Fi. Yeah, Winnipeg. You hear all the Winnipeg dig. No airport. Shitty. <laughs> the roads don't work. But no, that they didn't have that in the poll. They're not going to dump on uh, any of their any other cities. I was, full, I was fully expecting it scrolling down after seeing the best road city here. And then you see the worst city. But no, no, they didn't have that. 
Well, appreciate that because I think we know yeah. it probably would have ended up on that list for sure. Hey, before we go, let's get to the cool bet lines right now. Five games in the National Hockey League. Uh, and, of course, let's just see a little update right behind me. All right, so Jets minus 190 at home to the Flyers. <clears throat> and the puck line plus 127 to win by two. Other uh, matchups tonight, Rangers Canadians, Rangers minus 205. Stars, a huge favorite at minus 450. They, of course, can clinch their playoff spot with a win over the lowly Coyotes, who stunned the Minnesota Wild and ruined my pal Dusty's parlay yesterday on the lock shop. Uh, other games tonight, Vegas Golden Knights and the Blackhawks. Must-win situation for Vegas, and they're the biggest fans of the Arizona Coyotes right now. And the one final game tonight, the Kings and the Kraken. As far as the NBA playoffs go, we're going to have to wait till tomorrow for the Raptors to go at it. But tonight, the Milwaukee Bucks can finish off the Bulls. They were 10-point favorites yesterday. I'm seeing 12 and a half right now. And uh, the late game tonight, the Warriors can finish off the Nuggets. Warriors are eight-point home favorites to uh, beat the Nuggets. Uh, you could also check out, uh, we're on Cool Bet, heading into tomorrow, draft props for the NFL draft. And we'll hit those towards the end of tomorrow's show getting ready for the first round of the draft tomorrow night right here in Las Vegas. Uh, great show today, Remo. And uh, you're going to be at the game tonight? I'll be. Yeah, I'm going to be at all, all the games, uh, all the games uh, this week. Uh, you know, when the Jets are out of the playoffs and these are the games that I want to go to. Um, fan appreciation this weekend. And not tonight, we'll be seeing the Flyers. So someone in chat was projecting a 9-8 game tonight i think that would be exciting we could see ha -ha, you know yes we could see kyle connor score 50 and Ehlers scores 30th in the same game if we got to that and Ehlers was asked by paul edmonds about uh scoring if scoring 30 would mean something to him and i was fully expecting Ehlers to say you know i just want to make everyone happy who took the over on 29 goals for me this season i know there's a lot of people out there with tickets and i want to make those people proud that i can get to 30 but uh, he did not say that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no. Hey, he knows. He knows that we need two more for Nikolai Ehlers. Yeah. I'd be fine with three. But to me, 29 is the goal. Uh, Remo, great stuff today. Tomorrow we're going to have an awesome show. Uh, Ruwiki, I can't wait to have Ruwiki on. I know he's at the game tonight, of course. He's a big Flyers guy as well. We'll talk about it. And, um, and much more. Hoping to have Andy McNamara as well join me live here uh, at the D Hotel at Bar Canada in Las Vegas before tomorrow's first round of the NFL Draft. And then Axel will jump on with us for a few minutes on Friday to break it all down after tomorrow's festivities as things get going. Folks, that's going to do it for us. Let's get the pods up. Thanks, everyone, for being with us uh, here on YouTube Live. And for those of us listening a little later on on the podcast, a big thanks to all the sponsors that make Winnipeg Sports talk happen every day cool bet canada don't forget if you haven't bet a cool bet before use the promo code wst get a 100 bonus on your first deposit up to 200 bucks the nick and nicky dq group canadian club whiskey boston pizza princess auto little brown jug not auto corp breezy bend aikens lake wilderness lodge royal sports manitoba battery culligan water vita health f apparel and our newest sponsor our friends over at wallace and wallace uh, one more time from Bar Canada at the D Hotel. I'm Andrew Patterson for Michael Remus. Have a great night. Enjoy tonight's Jets Flyers game. We'll break it down for you tomorrow right here at 1 o'clock live on YouTube on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Sorry, just one, one more quick thing. The Bombers, New Jersey, we're going to have that tomorrow as well. And the CFL announced some new rule changes today. Came out just as we were getting the air, so we didn't get a chance to go through them. We will be going through those uh, tomorrow as well. Sorry to... Uh, rule changes, no, nothing, yeah. nothing too crazy, I hope. Just a couple minor changes to still improve. three downs, right? Uh, it's, yeah, yeah, still, still, still three. <laughs> that would have yeah. been a bit of a bombshell to drop no, right at the end of the program. Just a couple like stuff where the ball is going to be placed on the field. Um, the one interesting one they did finally allow two quarterbacks on the field would have been helpful to the Bombers. You know, when Chris Strebler was still in the CFL, but we'll go in, into those more more tomorrow but yeah no, still still three down <laughs> <laughs> okay Whew, good folks have a great night thanks for being with us we'll catch you tomorrow here as we continue our week in vegas on winnipeg sports talk have a great night and enjoy the game oh my god oh! shut it down let's go thanks for tuning in to winnipeg sports talk daily 
Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com. 